I think inflation is a story of the past. You may have some hiccups here in the short term that could create some near term volatility. Our highest conviction view this year was volatility. I think inflation comes back on the radar the second half of the year. What I think is going to happen over the course of this year is, yes, inflation is going to come down slowly. That deep inflation tail risk has kind of been cut off. So if you were to get inflation to a level where we have to kind of respect that tail again, then, yeah, that becomes a real risk for the market. The broad index is telling you a message. Inflation sticky. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Ferro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. We're starting today trying to explain yesterday, OK? Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Equity futures totally unchanged on the S&P. All-time highs coming off the back of a hotter than expected CPI report. So let's try and make sense of that. I'll give you two interpretations. Here's one. There's a difference between what economists expected and what the market was priced for. That's one. Here's two. It made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Brammer, which one was it? I think it's a little bit of both because basically you're having people justify the story at a time where there were more than half of the components of this index that came in hotter than expected with acceleration. Look, there are people who say there are a lot of year-over-year -year comp uh, seasonal issues with the fact that a lot of prices reset at the beginning of the year. They can explain it away because they say the Fed wants to cut rates. On the flip side, it doesn't make any sense for the Fed to cut rates if you see a reacceleration in goods pricing, if you see a reacceleration in a lot of other components of this index. So which is it? Is it a Fed that's bang on line going to cut rates no matter what? Or is it a stickier inflation that people really have to grapple with? Plenty of reaction from the South Side, including Mike Gapen over at Bank of America, who said this. Service inflation softened. Goods surprised. You can take more comfort, basically, from the former than discomfort from the latter. Stuart Kaiser of City, though, said this, Anne-Marie, and I think he's right. We're still on a downtrend, but the risks around that story have clearly shifted over the last month, which is why we've been pushing out the timing of that first cut. Right, and we also have to wait for PCE to come in because this is what the Fed looks at when they have their forecast. We heard from Ellen Zetner over at City. She's now penciling 0.3% for PCE. When they get PPI later this week, they're then going to go back and properly make those forecasts. But PCE is coming March 29th after the next Fed meeting. So what kind of clues are we going to get this week for the rest of the data from when after the next Fed meeting that can indicate what PCE comes in? And I think that's when people will have a little bit more conviction on where they think this inflation story is going. We are light on data this morning, but heavy tomorrow morning, that's for sure. Lisa, retail sales, PPI, and jobless claims on deck. And honestly, all of them are important. Retail sales are important because, frankly, when you look at some of the credit card spending data, it's conflicted. Some are saying that you're accelerating. Some are saying you're slowing down. Every bit of data is conflicted, so it's choose your own narrative time. And the narrative that people want to choose is stocks go up and bonds hang in there. And that's where the market's going. And stocks went up big time in yesterday's session. Biggest one-day pop in a month so far. That's the equity market story. Need to talk about what's happening down in Washington, D.C. There will be a vote today in the House on potentially, I stress potentially, either banning TikTok or pushing them to sell it. Right. It's going to go either direction. But it looks like the House this morning, uh, this afternoon, will vote yes on that bill. They need two thirds. They're bringing it up under suspension of rules. And then it goes to the Senate. This gets a little bit tricky. We're already hearing a lot of suspicion from some senators that there's parts of this bill they don't like. Does it give too much leeway to the president? What does this mean for other companies that can be in similar situations? So it's very fast right now, the momentum. That momentum may slow in the Senate. But the President of the United States says if it passes through both chambers, he's going to sign it. Can you tell us what China said about this today? What's yeah, the China, pushback been? Just a few hours ago, we heard from the Chinese uh, foreign ministry, and they said the United States is bullying, and they said this is going to come back to bite them. Already, potentially, we could see this becoming a bigger geopolitical story and a tit-for-tat between Beijing and Washington. You have to admire the blatant hypocrisy of China's position on this. Meta can't get in the country. Google tried and failed. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube are all banned. This is why I love this story so much. This captures the U.S.-China relationship across so many different dimensions. It exposes China's complete lack of reciprocity. It exposes the West's inability to deal with it. And I think also explains why there's always going to be this tension between these two countries. We play by very different rules. If she decides that, let's say, the U.S. version of TikTok coming into China is banned, guess what? It's banned. If someone tries to do that stateside, what happens? It takes ages. Okay and ages. Yes, and on one hand, you might say that's a feature, not a bug of democracy. On the other hand, that really raises a question of how you counter a nation that does play by very different rules with a very different set of business goals as they operate in this country. And frankly, when you start talking about TikTok, I think that 
our minds might have gone to some of the same places in terms of what does this say about our country and young people who, as the former President Trump said, are going to go crazy if they have their TikTok taken away from them. I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. I think that our young people probably are more resilient than that. I would hope so. But I do think the fact, and you pointed to this too, that the Pew Research Center polls said that about 43% of TikTok users say they regularly get their news there, twice the rate from three years ago, and about one in third, one in three of all adults younger than 30. Well, we've seen a lot of these individuals at the behest of TikTok actually call the representative and say, please don't vote for this. We want to make sure we can keep TikTok. Jonathan, you brought up a point about the fact that it's taken so long. Almost to the day a year ago, I wrote about what SIFI is told TikTok, which was sell or prepare for a ban. That was one year ago that my reporting came out. This has taken years to develop, and it kind of went silent for a while. And behind closed doors, you've seen lawmakers continue, especially some of these China hawks, continue to want to get this legislation through. And it took TikTok by surprise how quickly this is about to hit the House floor. More coverage of this story throughout this morning. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500. Just to get your day started this Wednesday morning, totally unchanged on the S&P. The euro goes in absolutely nowhere. And at the bond market, the tiniest bit of price action. We're up a single basis point on a 10-year, just about to 4.16. Coming up this hour, Katie Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex as the equity rally shrugs off another hot CPI print. Kim Wallace of 22V Research with the House set to vote on a bill that could force the sale of TikTok. And David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research on the state of the economy with the Fed decision just one week away. We begin with our top story. The S&P 500 shrugging off another hot CPI print, setting yet another all-time high. Kenny Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex is long equities and short fixed income as she says Fed cuts look further away. The key risk for Katie? Sticky inflation, a Fed that does not renounce rate cuts and unwinding momentum with crowded positioning in some key names. Katie joins us now for more. Morning, Katie. Good morning. Great to have you with us in New York. Let's start with yesterday. How did you explain yesterday? What was that? It was wild. I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, we have continued to see equity markets continue moving upwards. If you look at momentum signals and momentum positioning, it is at levels that you saw in the tech bubble, which to me is a little frightening. So valuations are high and the evidence is we're not going to have cuts soon. So it seems like the equity market doesn't care. Well, part of the reason why, and we heard this yesterday, is because the Fed says that they want to cut even if there isn't the justification to cut. How much is that underpinning the momentum trade that keeps on keeping on? Well, that's exactly why I said it's a concern that they're not going to renounce cuts. Because if inflation does come in higher, what does that mean to cut rates when you have inflation? Let's say it went to 4%. That doesn't make any sense to me in the sense that if you have higher inflation, that's just going to push prices higher and you're not going to have any restrictive policy to contain that inflation. And it's going to be even harder uh, to stop that type of, of increase in prices. So what about the market dynamic makes you think that bonds are waking up to that or will wake up to that and stocks will not? So you've seen that in the price action. Shorter term bonds have actually started going up in yield a little bit more. So the two year and the two year German bonds has been some of the bigger trends that we've been following on the short side. So it seems like the short end of the curve is starting to wake up a little bit to this. But what's always been very interesting to me this year is there's been a big disconnect in terms of the equity move and how fixed income has been reacting to recent moves thinking about cuts. And so equity just keeps soaring higher. So I guess they're not it's not concerned yet. That's why I pointed out the crowding potential and the idea that you have a lot of increases in certain names. So people are starting to get a little nervous about that concentration. So Katie, how are you positioning for that? If you're worried about that disconnect between stocks and bonds, what are you doing? Well, you're seeing very different asset class returns. And I want to point out as well that you're still seeing positive correlation between stocks and bonds and higher bond volatility. To us as quants, what that means is that inflation is still driving prices. And what's going on is really inflation-like moves. You're not seeing that classic risk-off relationship between stocks and bonds. Thus, you're seeing very disparate positions. And you're trading on a higher for longer at the same time as you're saying, Things look great in the equity market. Can we throw in the commodity market as well? Just looking at the screen, think about where we've been over the last few months. Gold's up, crude is sideways, iron ore has plunged. So that's inflation, stickiness and deflation all rolled into one. What signal can you take away from the commodity market? 
I love that. Um, the thing that we have seen that has been interesting is the disinflation in the agricultural market. That has been very consistent. What makes me nervous is that's the one thing people have been focused on. And if you see that start to turn and we start to see goods prices and commodity prices start to turn more on the upswing, then that inflation narrative starts to get a little bit more little room to run. But I do agree, oil has been tricky. It's very range bound. Um, and of course, some of the commodities like cocoa have been an outsider, uh, which has been up 20 something percent in the month of February. You mentioned so. cocoa in your note. Does it really matter these cocoa prices? It does from a from a multi-asset trading perspective in the sense that you have an asset. Um, we initially were kind of shocked because it's Valentine's Day in November, in February. And we said it turns out it was actually much more of a supply. It's much more of a supply chain story. But cocoa matters because it's one of those it's a, it's 27 percent means that there's going to be push on effects through the supply chain for an asset like that. But there's a huge dispersion. If you look at corn, corn is way down and cocoa is way up. So it kind of goes to John's point is you get to pick the narrative you like based on the asset class that you choose. So if it's cocoa, things are going up. If it's corn, things are going down. If it's oil, we don't know yet. Uh, that's what I want to ask you about. What's your prospect for oil? Is this solely a China story or do you see potential risks developing in the Middle East? So there's been continued volatility in oil prices based on the narrative in, in geopolitical issues in the Middle East. They haven't had a huge impact on prices yet, but there continue to be starts and stops where you see prices get a little bit of momentum based on news. But in general, they haven't broken out based on political news. And this is quite common in that that's one factor that impacts prices, but it hasn't been sustained so far. Taking a step back, there's a thesis that seems to be uh, sort of underpinning some of the rally that we're seeing in equities, which is even if bond yields go up, it won't really matter. Because what you're seeing right now is strength in the economy and the uh, maybe a little bit of warmth in the inflation reads really stems from that growth, which is positive for stocks. At which point are yields problematic for stocks that have seemed immune to higher rates so far? So I like this point, Lisa, because a lot of people don't want to say this but because it doesn't sound fun, but it seems like higher yields is less restrictive than people would have thought. Um, obviously, everyone wants lower yields because it is tougher on middle class and it's tougher on people trying to finance and deal with sort of other issues in terms of business practice. But at the same time, it doesn't seem to be that out of the normal for longer term yields. And for a short period of time, it looks like the equity market is still producing growth earnings. And we're navigating these higher rates, despite the fact that we don't like them. So Katie, you're staying short in the bond market? Yes, we're still seeing short signals in the bond market. Um, they are not as strong as they were before, but it has been interesting that we did capitulate and see long signals in January, but that quickly turned around. Um, I'm not seeing a large view on a short, but I do think yep. that there's room to move if we see inflation numbers come up, PCE and also PPI and retail sales this week. We've been whipsawed a few times in this bond market, that's for sure. Katie, it's good to see you. Here in New York, Katie Kaminsky there of Alpha Simplex. Your two-year this morning, higher by two basis points, 460 on a 10-year, up by a single basis point to about 416. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hakez. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Former President Donald Trump secured the Republican presidential nomination with primary victories in Georgia, Mississippi, and Washington. A rematch between Trump and President Biden is now set for November. Trump refrained from his usual post-primary victory party and instead posted a video statement on social media saying, quote, we're not going to take time to celebrate. We'll celebrate in eight months when the election is over. Citadel founder Ken Griffin says the Fed should move slowly in lowering rates so they don't have to reverse course later. Speaking at the Futures Industry Association conference, Griffin said, quote, pausing and then changing direction back toward higher rates quickly would be the most devastating course of action to pursue. He thinks the Fed will be slower than people are expecting for that very reason. The Fed's next policy decision is due next Wednesday. 
Boeing's crisis is growing wider. United Airlines telling the plane maker to stop building its new 737 MAX 10 jets. United confirming it's in talks to substitute planes from rival Airbus. Some of the biggest carriers gathered at a conference Tuesday and discussed similar issues stemming from Boeing's quality concerns. Boeing's stock is down over 29% so far this year. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. Elaine Becker coming up a little bit later. One question, Bramo. How much higher affairs go in this summer off the back of this? 100%. You talk about all the capacity concerns, talk about inflation. Let's talk about getting to, uh, you know, I don't know, Colorado. Yeah, that story coming up a little bit later this morning. Why Colorado? Well, it's skiing. You know, yeah, all right. You know why. Up next, the House voting on a TikTok ban. We want to make it uh, uh, something that is a, not a fearful social media platform, but one that is very positive. And in order to do that, we have to see the divesting of it from of the Chinese government. That conversation coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Really quiet price action to kick off Wednesday morning. Good morning to you. Going nowhere on the S&P. Going nowhere in the FX market. The euro, 109.29. And in the bond market, just about going somewhere. Yields are higher by a single basis point, 4.16. Under surveillance this morning, the House voting on a TikTok ban. What we continue to hear are the threats being posed to Americans by the Chinese Communist Party uh, through, um, in this case, uh, companies, in this case, more specifically, TikTok. We want TikTok to exist. We're not there to ban it. I've said we want to make it tic toe We want to make it uh, uh, something that is a, not a fearful social media platform, but one that is very positive. And in order to do that, we have to see the divesting of it from of the Chinese government. It's the latest this morning. The House set to vote today on a bill that would force TikTok's China-based parent company ByteDance to sell the app or face a ban in the U.S. The bill needs a two-thirds majority to pass before heading to the Senate. Kim Wallace of 22V Research writes in this, it is very likely that the bills will become law this month or next. We anticipate strong support in the Senate, with at least 60 senators likely to back the legislation as passed, easing action in that chamber to send President Biden a bill, which he has promised to sign. Kim Wallace joins us now for more. Kim, I want to start with the former president. The former president has form. He's blown up agreements on Capitol Hill before. Why is he struggling to blow up this one? I think for one reason, bipartisanship has been the key to China-U.S. relations for five or six years now. And as part of that, the national security concern of the TikTok application and what it means for surveillance back into China is a concern of three or four years now. The administration, as you all have noted, has worked with the Hill on legislation telling Congress that it needed broader authority. This is that broader authority. Well, China has already um, mentioned what they plan on doing. Basically, they say that they're, it's inevitably, inevitably going to come and back bite the U.S. itself. So basically, China's pointed to a potential tit for tat. Do you expect that? Do you expect China to do something in retaliation? Anne-Marie, the question is what they can do and what they will do. As the U.S. and China work work through a transition in their relationship, the administration calls it competition. It's competition across the front on many different platforms every day. And so as you saw coming out of the very, quote unquote, successful APEC meeting, when the U.S. and China... Uh, reignited discussions on all levels. Uh, There's still every day a sharp competition between the U.S. and China, not just on worldview, not just on national security imperatives, but also how governments treat people. This is not going to change. We are in a transition going from the happy days of WTO ascension for China Uh, to a much more realistic relationship. We hear from a lot of senators who are now wavering a little bit. I think of Senator Tom Tillis, who yesterday is talking about concerns and um, about what this could mean, the unintended consequences. This was an individual that last year told Congress they should be leading by example and ditching TikTok on their phones. Who in the Senate do you think is not going to back this? Because you say it's going to get 60 of them. The, The people who won't back it probably fall into two buckets. One, People who are persuaded by the argument that you shouldn't identify individual companies and freeze them out of markets. 
And then the second group will be those who are looking toward the election and don't want to do anything that might be perceived as a victory for President Biden. Let's talk about the tic-tac-toe we were just hearing about and how they want this to exist just in a different format. How could TikTok sell this to any U.S. company with this administration that essentially doesn't like tie-ups of large companies or even medium-sized companies and really stepped in to intervene at almost every single proposed deal? Lisa, I think that's the core of why this, is, this question has lingered from a policy standpoint for three or four years. The administration is certain about the national security risk that the TikTok application poses broadly across the U.S., at the same time, they're concerned about precedent. They're concerned about unintended consequences. And as I said before, they're very much concerned that maybe they don't have full legal authority to do what the interagency task force that spoke through CIF uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S. last year would want to do. They're looking for a partner. This is typical of uh, Joe Biden. Uh, you know, he is a man of the Senate. He has ideas, but he wants to have partners in the legislature. So even if this does get passed, are you saying, Kim, essentially nothing will actually happen for a very long time? It's hard to know. Remember, at the end of the Trump administration, Oracle was brought in by the DOJ and a deal was struck that they would be sort of a constant backdoor to traffic over TikTok and they could monitor without the company knowing. You come fast forward to the legislation doesn't require ByteDance to divest. It just says that the application cannot be operated in the U.S. if it comes from four countries, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and uh, North Korea. Uh, TikTok obviously is associated strongly with China. Kim, we got confirmation last night of Biden-Trump volume two. A lot of people in this country didn't want to see it. That's what we've got. With regards to this TikTok story, I think we've got a decent idea, as you've been explaining, as to how the current president is going to govern if he gets a second term. Do you have a decent idea of how the former president will govern, given how this story has played out? John, it's a great question, and I think TikTok is a wonderful example. Uh, president Trump is known to be very, former President Trump is known to be very transactional, and it is it is the fact that some of his friends have positions in TikTok that has caused him to waver. This is not new. We saw this in his second year uh, with ZTE and Huawei. Uh, his administration was set to basically put ZTE out of business, at least in the U.S., and he heard from friends who had positions in the company. Uh, it's two very stark different views of how to govern. And as much as people say, including me, uh, Americans do not want this rematch, it provides Americans who are strongly divided a very stark choice in governance. We potentially are going to see this bill. I just want to come back to it pass in the House today. You mentioned how this is be a win for Biden. But my question is, eight months before the election, this has issues for both Republicans and Democrats. Why are they doing it now, Kim? Anne-Marie, first, I did not mean to imply, and I think I heard myself say it's a win for Biden. I don't know that either party plays this issue very well. It's like immigration and others. I'm not sure it's a clear win for anyone. But the administration has been, for the last three years, very intent on the national security risk. To that extent, it might be perceived as a win. Outside of that, politically, I don't know how this plays. I don't think anyone does. Hey, Kim, great to get your thoughts. Appreciate your time this morning, sir. Kim Wallace there of 22V Research on this bill, going through the House a little bit later on this morning. 10 a.m. Eastern time, is that right? Well, that's when the House will be coming back in. Let's see. Sometimes these things tend to take a little bit more time. Just on this story, the former president clearly doesn't want this bill to go through. He's come out pretty clearly against Meta. Does that set us up for some kind of pursuit of Meta in the years to come if he gets back at the White House? Well, remember the FTC already has an ongoing issue with Meta in terms of thinking they're a monopoly, especially in the fact that they bought up Instagram and WhatsApp. That happened at the final weeks of the Trump administration. And then FTC chair now Lena Khan is dealing with it. And it's still ongoing. But I think whether or not it's a Biden or Trump White House, these antitrust issues are not going away. The issue is we keep flirting with this question of what are social media pro platforms doing to children and their minds and their education. And I will just say, as a mother of children, it's an ongoing concern. And I think that, that there are some conflicting messages from the types of policies that are driven from concern but lack of evidence. Yeah, if you have a child that is interested in communism and wants to be a communist, <laughs> I think Where? maybe look away from TikTok <laughs> and look towards who's teaching them. Because if they're not being taught about the pitfalls of that, then that's a problem with the education system, not the platforms.
there's a lot of questions. Do, they understand, that. Sure. do they understand the propaganda they're being fed? Snapping a two-day losing streak on the S&P 500 yesterday in a rather bizarre fashion. Hotter than expected CPI. Equity markets all-time highs, apparently. Equity futures this morning just about unchanged on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, a little bit softer. We're negative by 0.1%. Let's turn to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year, two-year, 460. About 10 basis points and change away from where we were a couple of weeks ago. Up another two basis points this morning on a two-year. At least for an intuitive reaction in the bond market, yields are up. Counterintuitive in the equity market, we just ripped. A few minutes after the CPI report came out, we dropped and it literally lasted about 60 seconds. And then we rallied and we didn't turn back. I spent the whole evening trying to understand this. And I spent the whole evening, which a lot of people might judge, but trying to understand the different components of inflation and why people were so sanguine about a reacceleration in inflation when we're seeing a reacceleration in things like goods, in things like certain services, in airplane tickets, in uh, on used car prices. And the answer, the only answer I can come up with is that people don't really believe this is lasting and that they believe the Fed's gonna cut anyway. And to the extent that there's any inflation, it's positive for equities because that means there's strength in the underlying economy. And that is the Goldilocks story and it persists. You're right to go through the breakdown. And I'm not sure if equity markets were this nuanced yesterday, but David Rosenberg's gonna join us later. The bits that are in CPI that won't be in PCE, I wonder if that sort of evolves in a favorable manner for the Federal Reserve. A lot of people looking to certain components that did see a little disinflation that will make it easier. That said, what inflation data dependent Federal Reserve can look at this and feel confident that they're on their path Straight down up. to 2%? I am struggling with that. The market seems to think it's less of a struggle. You're not alone. We'll catch up with Rosenberg about this in just a moment. Let's finish on foreign exchange. The euro at about 109, 109.30. Heard from a central bank governor a little bit earlier this morning, one from France, another one from Austria. Both of them really just leaning into June. June seems to be the month for the ECB for liftoff. Yeah, you're talking about Villeroy, Francois Villeroy. Your buddy in France, yes, yeah. exactly. I, I mean, honestly, the, he's talking about pushing it back to June. The market doesn't believe him. So, you know, the rhetoric at this point isn't matching with some of the actual data points. And in Europe, they actually have a reason. You're not actually concerned about an overheating economy. In the U.S., it's a little bit different. So at this point, how much is job owning going to work? True. Let's finish on foreign exchange and dollar yen specifically. 147.95. That currency pair just firmer by 0.2%. A slightly weaker Japanese yen off the back of this story this morning. Under surveillance, our top story, the BOJ monitoring wage hikes as automakers boost pay and meet union demands. Toyota will raise salary and bonuses for a fourth straight year. The auto giant joins Honda, Mazda and Nissan who have all agreed to raise Raise pay during annual spring wage negotiations. Governor Ueda is saying this year's wage talks are an important item to watch heading into next week's decision. This is a big one. I think we're something like 5 to 6% with the wage hikes at the other manufacturers. We didn't actually get a number from Toyota this morning, but this is the direction of travel in Japan. And the reason why you think that Friday is the most important day of the week, right? You think that that's going to be the data point when they get you some sort of Big union. Deal? We find out what that wage hike you is know, like. Jonathan Farrow, avid follower of Japanese unions. So there was this one union that represents about 60 uh, different groups that did secure this 5.3% price increase overnight. So people looking into this to, as a signal, given the fact that that's the fastest wage growth that we've seen going back decades. Again, it's just a matter of when and how they yeah. message it. So at this point, the tea leaves, I don't know. Do people kind of move on and just say, OK, it's going to happen? It's I think messaging play. matters. Dario Perkins over in London put this beautifully this morning out on Twitter, X. He said this, 5% wage growth in Japan, virtuous wage price cycle. 5% wage growth in the Eurozone, which we spent a decade battling the risk of Japanization, Japanization, dangerous wage price spiral. Isn't it different? In Europe, it's a dangerous wage price spiral. And in Japan, it's a virtuous wage price cycle. It's a very, very different way of looking at the same thing. Two things. Is the Japanese economy structurally different than Europe and the US and Europe in particular? Some people might argue no. And if that's the case, is it wrong to fight inflation? It gets the question of whether central bankers think it might be good to run the economies a little bit hotter to avoid the Japanese-like spiral, which get, brings in a whole other you know, ball of worms, which may be why the Fed is uh, excited to cut maybe beyond what people would expect. Friday, big day, wage negotiations, big union in Japan. It's going to shake up dollar yen 
We'll look out for that. I want to turn to this story. Donald Trump and President Biden securing enough delegates to clinch nominations in their respective parties. Voters in Georgia, Mississippi, Washington helping to finalize a rematch of the 2020 election. Trump continuing to take further control of the GOP, firing more than 60 staffers in the RNC as it shares closer ties with the campaign. Yesterday, President Biden was meeting with leaders of the Teamsters Union in a bid to help secure an endorsement, a worry that maybe they're looking in Trump's direction. Well, yeah, because when you look at the polling of individuals at the rank and file, less so the leadership of unions, you have seen Trump actually gain some of the momentum with those individuals. That's why Biden, not just because he wants to be the most pro-labor union president in history, he also wants their endorsement. Um, this story is a little bit of a shrug. It's the rematch we all knew was coming. It's the rematch no one wants, but it's going to cost a fortune because it means the general election is so much longer. And these individuals have to be in the public eye longer. They have to campaign longer. This is going to be expensive and it's going to be difficult more so for the Trump campaign than the Biden campaign because Trump is paying his legal fees with some of these campaign donations. It begs the question, and I thought we'd hear more about this overnight, running mate. When do we find out? Not sure yet. I mean, there's a few people that are, you know, on the short list. Elise Stefanik comes to mind. Katie Britt comes to mind. Maybe that audition tape. Not sure how well that went down with some members, not just the electorate, but even the Republican Party. Christy Nome. J.D. Vance, Christy Nome, Vivek Ramaswamy. You know, Trump loves to also play kingmaker. And I think for a little bit, he loves this idea, this aura around it. He has a number of surrogates going out on the news for him. So maybe he'll just wait to decide on the VP. Slightly random, but I want to squeeze this in. Christy Nome, did you see the governor on Twitter yesterday promoting a dentist in Texas? <laughs> it's the weirdest video. You want to go and have a look at it? Go and have a look at it. It made no sense at all. What was that about? Any idea at all? Not sure. Dental Relate surgery in, in Texas. It was Relating really, really bizarre. I thought Relating she'd been hacked. <laughs> I thought she'd been hacked when I saw that. Well, you know, there's sort of these like small stories. How do you relate to the people? Maybe that's one way. Oh, that's one way. Yeah. I guess, I well, guess why maybe. in Texas, though? It would make more sense. That's why none of it made sense <laughs> at all. Let's finish on this story. United Airlines telling Boeing to stop building 737 MAX 10 jets as it switches to a rival Airbus model. The warning coming as a path to certification for the MAX 10 becomes uncertain. United CEO Scott Kirby making the comments at a JP Morgan investor conference. Deliveries for Boeing 737 jets has slowed to 17 from 25 month over month. Southwest also warning its schedules would be cut and hiring plans would be frozen due to Boeing's weaker output. Helene Becker of TD Cowan joins us around the table. Helene, we've been looking forward to this because I only have one question and then everyone's got tons more than me. <laughs> How much affairs going to go up this summer because of this? Um, yeah, they're heading up and we're thinking sort of mid single digits. It's, and then maybe a little bit more in markets that people want to go to. Europe comes to mind. Um, Asia is growing this summer. Uh, domestic U.S., a lot of capacities come out of the U.S. market. So we're definitely seeing fares going up. So the logical question is, how much is this truly because of Boeing issues? And how much is this just because they want bigger margins? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I think there are a lot of things that are playing on the industry um, that are causing airfares to go up. And first of all, you've had huge labor um, wage increases across the board. Flight attendants are negotiating now, and they're just past peak, so they may not get the sizable increases pilots got last year, but they're still going to get big increases. So that's one thing to think about. And then you have infrastructure issues. The FAA has asked the airline, four big airlines serving the New York market to cut capacity by 10%. They did that last year and they asked that it continue at that level through October of this year. So for 18 months, you're seeing growth in this market, but you don't have capacity to fill the seats. And then if you look at what the airlines have been doing, the up gauging more seats per departure and fewer departures per day, which is something we've been talking about since before the pandemic, um, because the delivery delays, you, you still have relatively small aircraft. So you have capacity down, say, 5 or 7% from where it was, but you have demand up 10% from where it was, 6 to 10%, depending on day of week and month of, of year. And so fares have no choice but to go up. I find the story fascinating from a personal perspective because I like to travel, but also from an economic perspective because yes. a lot of people have been pointing to the fact that spending has been so resilient in the airplane sector that you have seen just so many people continuing to travel even as this narrative of some sort of crimped budgets and savings running out has played out. 
What do you make of this? That basically, is this a priority area or is this a sign of a consumer that just has plenty of money to spend? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question because I thought last year as we had inflation, higher food costs, higher fuel costs, more ex most people drive to work, so more money for, for gasoline, all of the things that you guys have been talking about this morning with respect to inflation um, and higher interest rates, student loan payments, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I really thought we'd see demand come down, and it hasn't, to your point. It's been very strong. And what I, th I think there are two things playing on that. One is um, I think people are just tired of being cooped up for so long, and they're just hitting bucket list trips. And, the sec and they're afraid, potentially, that they're going to have to go back to work five days a week instead of four. <laughs> and so I think that's one thing that's weighing um, heavily. And I think the other thing that's weighing on consumers is the idea that um, the places they, the world is changing and the places they want to go may not be available for them to go to in the future. So think about um, pre-pandemic, things like where were bachelor and bachelorette parties taking place, right? We saw a lot of them in Nashville, Asheville, Miami, but then they shifted to Montreal and Iceland and Cartagena and in Colombia, and then they shifted to Europe. I mean, really crazy places, um, but not all those places may be available as we think about the future of travel. So I think people are just squishing it all in um, as soon as they can. I'd love to know who's doing these bachelorette parties. I have not been invited <laughs> to one of these. Um... Jet Blue to Cartagena, if, <laughs> in case anyone's interested. Is that what you were looking up over there? <laughs> when you look at raising bag fees, American, Delta, United all just did it as well. Mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal recently wrote about how they're coming after as well your carry-ons. What kind of bag fees are we talking about? And it feels like the airlines are going after anything they could potentially you know, make money off of from and on top of the fact that airfares are going up. Yeah, so this is a dangerous game I think they're playing, right? Bag fees hadn't gone up in, I don't know, three or five years. So they went up $5 um, recently. But a lot of people, you can get away with not paying those bag fees if you have the credit card, if you have status. So what they're really doing is driving loyalty to their programs, and that's easy to do if you live in New York and you're a JetBlue United American or Delta frequent flyer or Dallas and you're American and Southwest. But when you get to the MidCon um, where there are no hubs, um, then you're really not a frequent flyer. So that's where you either need to have an airline credit card and most Americans don't. Most Americans have the cash back card and then a gasoline card. Airline credit cards are down the list. Um, so they're the ones that are impacted, but people with status, corporates, they don't they don't pay the increase. So it's the infrequent traveler that kind of gets caught both ways. Elaine, just a final question for me: just how American Airlines can capitalize on this moment, and how sensitive the consumers might be to the manufacturer of the plane they're flying on. Is that even a thing yet? Are you seeing that? Are consumers sitting there and saying, "I don't want to fly with United. They they buy lots of Boeing. I want to go with American Airlines instead." Is that a thing? You know, it should be, but it's not. I think people really don't look at the aircraft they're flying on until maybe they're flying on the plane. Um, and then they see, oh, I'm on an A319, or this is the smallest plane I've ever been on. It turns out to be a regional jet or, yep. you know, whatever. But I don't r really think they focus on the aircraft type as much as the schedule. First and foremost, am I loyal to this airline? Do I have the airline credit card? Am I getting double, triple, whatever points? And then the second big thing, what's the schedule? When am I going to get there? How reliable is the airline? Um, you know, I think that's a big issue for people. If, if you plan your trip around, you know, your baby's nap time or something, um, or, you know, business meetings or whatever, you really don't want a two or five hour delay because it kind of screws up all your plans. True, before you go, top pick right now. What is it? What do you um, like? Yeah, so we really like Delta, United and Copa. Those are our top three choices with Delta, our best idea for 2024. Cool. Elaine, good to see you. Thanks. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Elaine Becker there of TD Cowan. I don't think consumers do that either. I think this is what Michael O'Leary Michael of Ryanair believes too, which is why he's still looking 
at Boeing. I'm so concerned. I'm so concerned. Price lower. Poof. Right. There you go. I mean, no, that's basically price and status. I took a pit stop in London for points while Jonathan flew direct and he couldn't believe I did it. Isn't that what you're meant to do? Just fly. Why wouldn't you just fly direct? Yeah. Well, I mean, I was trying to save the planet and uh, AMH just cared about uh, points, which is just a I terrible I don't even travel thing. because I'm trying to save exactly. the planet. Exactly. You should walk. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. You really should stop doing that. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Fires erupting at a major oil refinery in Russia after a drone strike from Ukrainian forces. The facility is about 120 miles southeast of Moscow and serves as a key supplier of fuel for the eastern part of the country. The strike marks the second instance just this week of Ukrainian drones damaging Russian oil facilities. President Vladimir Putin saying the attacks aim to interfere with Russia's presidential election happening this week. A warning from the president of Poland in an interview on Bloomberg's balance of power, President Andrzej Duda said Vladimir Putin would attack other states if Russia wins its war in Ukraine. His warning comes at a critical moment in Ukraine's war with Russia as allies are scrambling to provide more military assistance to Kyiv. Questions about President Biden's mental fitness took center stage with special counsel Robert Hur on Capitol Hill. He's the prosecutor who declined to charge the president over his handling of classified documents in a report that described him as a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Hur defended his decision, saying, I understood that my explanation about this case had to include rigorous, detailed and thorough analysis. I cannot simply announce that I recommended no criminal charges and leave it at that. I needed to explain why. And that's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Yahira, thank you. Up next on the program, hot inflation, leaving some investors split. Yes, inflation is going to come down slowly. And I think that's fast. You know, I think that will be fast enough for the Fed to start cutting in June. They're telling you we want to cut rates. The problem is the data is not letting them. That was a fantastic conversation yesterday. More on that in just a moment. Live from New York City, this is Bloomberg. Equity futures on the S&P 500 just about positive by 0.06% after closing at all-time highs in yesterday's session. Yields a little bit higher by almost a single basis point on a 10-year, 4.15.86. Under Savannah's this morning, hot inflation leaving some investors split. What I think is going to happen over the course of this year is, yes, inflation is going to come down slowly. And I think that's fast. You know, I think that will be fast enough for the Fed to start cutting in June. They're telling you we want to cut rates. The problem is the data is not letting them. And this has been the driving force behind our call all year that they probably weren't going to be given the opportunity in 2024 because the economy is not going to give them the opportunity. Here's the latest this morning. Hotter than expected CPI reinforcing the Fed's cautious approach with one week remaining until the next Fed decision. Plus, more data on deck with retail sales and PPI due tomorrow. David Rosenberg, president of Rosenberg Research, writing, quote, there is nothing in the CPI report to get the Fed in a position to be cutting rates anytime soon. I'm pleased to say that David joined us now for more. David, great to catch up with you, sir. It's been too long. I just think you're perfectly positioned to run through this for us in detail. The pieces of this that will spill over to PCE, the bits that matter to the Fed, and ultimately the parts that won't. Right. Well, look, I think that um, the bottom line is that the Fed does not target uh, the CPI or the core CPI. It targets the PC deflator uh, and the core PC deflator. And I think that one of the, I think, uh, more welcoming elements uh, in yesterday's CPI data was the fact that medical care goods and services uh, were flat as a pancake. Uh, and that feature is much larger in the PC deflator. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised uh, when you reweight the components uh, of the CPI to the PC deflator uh, that the core ends up coming in closer to 0.3 or 0.2 than the 0.4 we saw in the core CPI. So my view was that uh, yesterday's consumer price report uh, is going to be uh, a distant memory uh, within the next uh, three to four weeks. So I'm not, I'm not as fussed about it as a lot of the other commentators you had on your show. It seems like, David, that the markets agree with you. Are the markets responding appropriately to a report that you think is uh, maybe a bit misleading? Well, look, the stock market is really operating uh, on, a, on a set of uh, momentum uh, and uh, technical factors. Um, 
and uh, not really, I don't think, paying attention much to what's happening in the economy. I mean, you have a stock market up 30% in the past year, thereabouts, and earnings are up 4%. Um, so it's really been a multiple-driven market. Uh, the bond market sold off moderately, as, as you would have expected, on a higher-than-expected, uh, especially core CPI print. Um, but in the overall scheme of things, uh, I mean, you have people on your show saying that, you know, inflation is, is taking its time coming down. Uh, and inflation usually does that. It's like a race between watching grass grow and paint dry. It's not, uh, you know, <laughs> inflation isn't Bitcoin uh, or the CRB index or uh, NVIDIA stock. Uh, it usually is glacial. But the bigger picture is this, you know, when we strip out the shelter components of the CPI, which we all know are flawed in their treatment uh, and they're lagged, uh, headline inflation X shelter is running at 1.8% year over year, it's already below target. This time last year, it was running at 5%. So I would just suggest, let's move away from focusing exclusively on the monthly wiggles on the data and look at the bigger picture because the broader trends in inflation and core uh, are moving down. And I think moving down in a rather impressive fashion, notwithstanding yesterday's data point. I guess what strikes me, David, is it seems like the balance of risks is is perhaps a little bit more skewed to higher inflation after this report, especially because it doesn't seem like rates where they are now are particularly restrictive when it comes to capital markets and when it comes to uh, risk asset valuations. So why should the Fed go ahead with cutting rates at a time where it doesn't seem like their higher rates are really affecting the economy or markets? And it seems like there still are questions around inflation. Well, there's no doubt that financial conditions uh, have eased uh, rather dramatically in the course of the past few months. Uh, but I don't think that's why the economy did as well as it did last year and into the fourth quarter. It was really a lot of fiscal juice. Uh, it wasn't really about financial conditions. You got uh, um, you know, a, a rapid decline in the equity cost of capital. High yield spreads are super tight. But where's the CapEx boom coming out of that? Uh, we're not really seeing it. Uh, last year's story, I mean, two-thirds of the growth in the economy last year came from the direct and indirect impact of fiscal stimulus, uh, which, frankly, I wasn't expecting. I, I don't know if you were expecting it. I wasn't expecting that the deficit was going to expand 25% last year in the context of a sub-4% unemployment rate. That's never happened before. So true. Uh, so a lot of the growth was really fiscal. Uh, financial conditions have eased, but I'm not really seeing any dramatic impulse uh, on economic activity from the easing and financial conditions. And the one thing I'm going to point out is, you know, the Fed is telling us increasingly that it is, you know, shifting its focus from the month-to-month -month gyrations in the data, of course, that grab the headlines until the next month's data come out, and they're focused on what business contacts are telling them. And quite frankly, when you look at uh, the swath of comments coming out of the base book, uh, the latest base book out of the Fed, uh, what did it say? It said that businesses found it harder to pass through higher costs to their consumers who became increasingly sensitive to price changes. So that's what's happening in the real world. And in the CPI world, we have over 40% of the items in that index are imputed guesswork by BLS statisticians as it pertains to services. So when you look at the real world, what did the Walmart CF, uh, CFO tell us a couple of weeks ago about pricing trends at Walmart, the world's uh, largest retailer is that their pricing momentum is actually dissipating. So uh, I'm not getting too fussed by one monthly uh, CPI number, that's for sure. Uh, David, I've got about 45 seconds left with you. I wanted to squeeze this in. There's a phrase I see a lot from research at the moment, and it's, it's not 1999. And I just wonder, from your perspective, what is the value of benchmarking to such an extreme time in the equity market? Is there any value in that at all? No, I don't think that it's... Uh it's useful to compare it to uh, today's world, to any other world, any more than in 07, people comparing it to previous cycles. Uh, every cycle has its uh, unique characteristics. Uh, every cycle has its um, similar patterns. Uh, no, I'm not saying this is like 1999 uh, or the dot-com bubble, because most of those companies didn't have a business model and uh, didn't have uh, earnings. However, however, we do have a situation where the forward multiple now in the S&P is 21, uh, and it is in the top 10%, to the top decile of valuations in history. So it doesn't detract. I mean, people like to say it's not 1999. Well, go, you know, go, go knock yourself out on that comparison. But whether you're taking a look at corporate credit, uh, you're taking a look at um, the equity market, 
it's a nosebleed territory in terms yep. of uh, valuations and so that's where I come out of it that is still a very expensive set of circumstances in uh, across most asset classes. David, and we're going to so continue it's this not conversation. As, it's not as dire as it was in 99, but it's, it's Another still time. a constraint. David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research. David, appreciate it, sir. Live from New York, the second hour of surveillance, mm -hmm. up next. Stocks still represent the best place, particularly U.S. stocks, if you want to compound your wealth. This is still a year for us in terms of U.S. exceptionalism. It's hard to get too spooked by stocks when earnings have been as strong as they have. If you keep printing 150 or 200K jobs in the U.S., it's really hard to not like owning equities in that environment. We're finally coming out of this COVID environment. Investors will, will remain in the highest quality mega cap names. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Stocks still represent the best place, particularly U.S. stocks, if you want to compound your wealth. This is still a year for us in terms of U.S. exceptionalism. It's hard to get too spooked by stocks when earnings have been as strong as they have. If you keep printing 150 or 200K jobs in the US, it's really hard to not like owning equities in that environment. We're finally coming out of this COVID environment. Investors will, will remain in the highest quality mega cap names. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Your equity market on the S&P 500 just about positive by 0.05% after closing yesterday at another all-time high on the S&P 500. Just moments ago, David Rosenberg on this program talking about the difference, Lisa, between CPI world and what he calls the real world. Basically, in the real world, as he emphasized from the Beige Book, is people pushing back and some of the price increases, people definitely feeling a bit more constricted, and companies being a bit more cautious with respect to business investment. This is the reason why there are so many people taking only the good and rejecting the bad from yesterday's CPI report, and that is why you saw stocks just is a screaming buy yesterday afternoon. Would you like a view of Ken Griffin's world? over at Citadel. Do you I see that quote? I love did, this quote. Of course. Pausing and then changing direction back towards higher rates quickly, that would, in my opinion, be the most devastating course of action to pursue. He went on to say, I think they're going to be a bit slower than people were expecting. Well, the concern there is, and we heard Citigroup talk about this at one point as well, what if the Fed were to cut and then realize they didn't handle inflation properly and then have to go back at some point the end of this year or next year and start hiking again? And then they come out and say, actually, we made a mistake. But to David Rosenberg's point, bottom line is Fed does not target CPE, though the consumer looks at CPE, and that's how they make their guesses about inflation and where the economy is going, but the Fed does not. So we have to wait, really, to decide what's going on until March 29th. I'm looking forward to catching up with Stephen Stanley later this hour from Santander. If you're not familiar with his call, it's 50 basis points of rate cuts this year, and they don't come, not June, not later in the summer, they don't come until after November, after the election in America. That's a very, very different call to what we're hearing elsewhere. And he sat on this set and talked to us about it. And he said, you know, I'm getting a lot of hate. It's getting a lot of pushback. I wonder if he feels a little bit more confident right now, especially after that CPI report. Again, people are taking what they want from this number. You can justify why the Fed shouldn't cut it all this year. You could also justify why there's some sort of fleeting uh, indicators here. The question is, we don't know. Yeah. And really, the bigger question to me is, what is the harm in holding rates higher for longer versus cutting sooner? I don't have a good answer out of that either. Governor Wallace said the same thing. President Kashkari asked the same question. Why do anything at all? With regards to Stanley's call, if you really think about it, let's talk about the start date. That's a bit controversial, waiting until after the election. That's a long time. But the size, 50 basis points, we could have a median dot next week on the SCP come down to just two rate cuts for 2024. He's not that far away from this Federal Reserve. Neil Kashkari basically confirmed that, that he doesn't really see a need to move and that only one or two rate cuts might be necessary. 
The dots haven't really been taken as gospel by this market. The Fed has been saying the same message. Will it be taken as gospel this time around? Will people trust them more as a guide, even though nobody can get this right? I mean, forecasting what's going to happen is like dartboards. And, yeah, it's I mean, it's really blindfolds and yeah, darts and all of that stuff. Yeah. That's a great description. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Lots of data tomorrow, just for you, those of you that want to know what's coming up. No data really this morning whatsoever. Tomorrow, though, you will have jobless claims, retail sales, PPI, jobless claims. We're looking for that to come up to about 218 from 217. So still exceptionally low. And then a little bit later this morning, you'll get a vote at the House of Representatives down in Washington, D.C., potentially banning TikTok or forcing them to sell it. So look out for that a little bit later as well. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. Let's start with equities on the S&P 500. Equity futures shaping up as follows on the S&P. We are just about positive on the S&P by around about 0.06%. In the bond market, yields are higher by, let's call it a single basis point, 4.15.86. And foreign exchange is quiet, for the euro at least, 109.32 on that currency pair. Coming up this hour on this programme, Catherine Keating of BMY Mellon with the S&P 500 posting a 17th record high of the year. Bill Dudley of Bloomberg Opinion on the Fed's next goal and Willie Caesar of Credit Sites calling for the yield curve to disinvert by year end. We begin with our top story. Stocks striking off a hotter than expected CPI print to post the biggest day of gains in almost three weeks. Catherine Keating of BMY Mellon Wealth Management telling investors to stay in equity markets and calling bonds a quote once in a decade opportunity saying while cash was the move two years ago now is the time to move into bonds. Catherine I'm pleased to say joined us now for more. Catherine great to see you. Great to see you. Thank You've you. got one of my favourite quotes and whenever I hear this I always <laughs> read it twice. Missing just the best 20 days in the equity market over the past 30 years cuts returns in half. Missing the 40 best days results in negative returns. That always shocks me whenever I read it, whenever I hear it. Is half of your job therapy to keep people in the equity market? I don't think it's therapy, but I think it's reminding them that the biggest advantage that an investor has is time. Time in the market is much more important than timing the market because over time, markets go up. So staying in the market, being invested, that doesn't mean being static. That doesn't mean you don't make judgments about which asset classes you think are stronger. But being in the market is the most important um, advantage that an investor has. That might be true broadly in the United States, but lost decades are not unusual. We've seen them in Japan. More recently, we just recaptured an all-time high. It took since 1989 to get back there. So what makes the United States and the U.S. capital markets somewhat unique in that regard? So we're a large um, and highly liquid market, obviously, but if I step back and think about the U.S. market today and where we are, number one, um, we have a very good ecosystem to invest in. We have a growing U.S. economy, you know, 2% or so this year. Um, number two, um, large companies in this country in particular are relatively insulated right now from higher interest rates. And why is that? Because when rates dived in 2020 and 2021, they took advantage of that. And they refinanced debt and they extended maturities. And so right now, large companies in this country are actually relatively well insulated from higher rates. That will change as years goes on, and it will definitely change by the time you get to 2030. But for right now, um, companies are doing well. Earnings are positive. We're out of the earnings recession of last year. Fundamentals are good. Um, and so we think that it's a good place to be. You know, I was really excited to speak with you about the psyche of the retail investor this morning, given the fact that you're seeing all-time highs and how that feeds into their willingness to spend. I know that you work with them on both sides of this. Do a lot of people directly increase their spending when they see bigger gains from their investments? Yeah, so the answer is that depends. If we step back and we think about um, the consumer, which is two-thirds of the economy, and the individual investor, which is two-thirds of investment assets, that individual is actually in pretty strong shape right now. Just as large companies took advantage of low interest rates and are relatively insulated from the higher rates we have right now, so are individuals. What did people do when mortgage rates went down dramatically in 2020 and 2021? They refinanced. They locked in lower rates. And of course, mortgages are the, are the largest category of consumer debt. At the same time, um, consumers and, and individual investors have been, have been very responsible in, um, in how they're handling their balance sheets. You know, debt service is less than 10% of disposable income, very strong uh, for the consumer. I guess that what I'm trying to get at here is when we're looking at CPI yesterday and trying to understand the resilience of the consumer, I wonder how much of a role markets are playing. 
that essentially there's been an easing in financial conditions and people are earning yes. pretty hefty returns on their stock and bond investments so far this year, last year, et cetera. How much does that bolster their ability and willingness to spend keeping this sort of cycle going? Well, you're, this is a very good question and you're absolutely right. There is a very important wealth effect that impacts the individual investor and the consumer. And if you think about consumer wealth broadly, it's up 30% since before the COVID crisis. Why is that? Prices of homes are up, markets are up. And so you see a consumer wealth number of $150 trillion, up $30 trillion just over the last four years. So the wealth effect is very profound. You're absolutely right. How reluctant are clients, investors, to get back into bonds? This is a big push of yours. How reluctant are they? So there's no question about the fact that the last two years you were better off in cash, right? The Federal Reserve has anchored these rates at you know, 5%, better off in cash. The question for every investor is, where will you be better off the next one, three, and five years? You're always investing for the future, not the past. And we are confident that you will be better off in bonds over the next one, three, and five years. And the reason for that is that we have a lot of experience. And we know that when you reach peak uh, Fed funds rates, then they do start to go down. And, you know, we can debate the path and how quickly, but they sure. do start to go down. And when that happens, bonds appreciate. And you, you tend to see returns in the bond market that are two times and three times the returns on cash. So we're, we're highly confident in that. And, and in particular, we like municipal bonds for three reasons, right? Our, our clients pay taxes, right? They're tax exempt. Um, number one. Number two, the municipal bond market is a very strong active management market, right? There are 500 stocks in the S&P 500. There are 80,000 municipal bond issuers. So there's a lot of opportunity for that. And then number three is the point that I just made. If you add duration now, as rates go down, the price goes up. Catherine Keating is going to be sticking with us to talk about this bond market. If you are interested in where we're trading right now in the bond market, at least at a 10-year up about a single basis point, 416, the two-year 460, just off the highs of where we were a few weeks ago. I think a big question right now would be, have we seen the high for the two-year yield? so far this year? It's a great question, especially because it's almost sacrilegious to say that the Fed isn't at their peak rate because they're basically saying that they are. But here's the question. What are we going back to? Is this sort of a natural progression to back to 2% or not? And ultimately, that is the ultimate question that's splitting Wall Street in some of their prognostications about peak rates and where we go from here. Just on the timing, do you remember post-GFC? Do you remember all those charts that just showed where Wall Street thought rates were going? And it was just sort of like lift off false dawn, lift off false dawn. And we always thought rates were going up and they ultimately never did. Is post-pandemic going to be the inverse of that chart where it's like cuts, false dawn, cuts, false dawn, where we're just sort of waiting, waiting, waiting? If you knew that answer, I'd have to kill no, you. No, I just, I mean, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's a great question. And I think ultimately, everyone disagrees on the answer, depending on who you are, depending on whether you've got a sort of more inflationary regime or whether you've got a disinflationary regime. This is the key question right now, I would say, of 2024. I feel like you've got something to say about that. Have you got an answer to that? Do you think we could have the inverse of that chart in the years to come? Just false dawn after false dawn, looking for rate cuts that don't come? Look, uh, the Fed has a dual mandate, right? Full employment, price stability, full employment check. Right? Unemployment has been below 4% for two years, even as it's creeping up. They are highly, highly focused on price stability. So back to the, back to the CPI, you know, the, lo the long-term trend over the last couple of years is quite clear, over 9% down to 3.2. But the path from 3.2 to 2 really depends on uh, three things, the components of CPI, goods, services, shelter. Goods, we've historically had no inflation in goods in this country. It's a highly competitive market. We're back to almost no inflation now on goods. Um, if you added goods and services together, we'd be at about 2% CPI. So the real issue is shelter, which is the largest component. And when we think about it, you know, you, you uh, sign up a lease for a year. Um, your mortgages are long term. Um, so, the, so it's really all about the shelter um, component. And one of the reasons that the market did well yesterday is because they saw that come down a little bit from January. So that's it. That's the question about inflation. Shelter, shelter, shelter. And how sticky is it? And when does it come down? You're taking the tiniest bit of comfort from that, relatively speaking. Catherine, you're going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say. Equity futures on the S&P 500, just about positive. Mm -hmm. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. A warning from the president of Poland in an interview on Bloomberg's balance of power. President Andrzej Duda said Vladimir Putin would 
would attack other states if Russia wins its war in Ukraine. His warning comes at a critical moment in Ukraine's war with Russia as allies are scrambling pro- to provide more military assistance to Kyiv. Boeing's crisis is growing wider. United Airlines telling the plane maker to stop building its new 737 MAX 10 jets. And United confirming it's in talks to substitute planes from rival Airbus. Some of the biggest carrier- carriers gathered at a conference Tuesday and discussed similar issues stemming from Boeing's quality concerns. Boeing's stock is down over 29% so far this year. A setback for a Japanese startup hoping to enter the crowded commercial space race. Space One's first rocket launch exploded in flames just seconds after taking off. The company's CEO says a self-destruct order was sent to the unmanned vessel about five seconds after launch, with a panel to investigate what happened. Space One was trying to send a government satellite into space. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahira, thank you. Up next on the program, it's Biden-Trump once again. I extend an open hand, an open invitation, and I ask you to join us on the noble quest of saving our country. Folks, it's not hyperbole to guess. Our freedoms are literally on the ballot this November. How many months of this have we got? Eight. Eight. Something like eight months. Wow. All right, that's next on the program. This is Bloomberg. Stocks on the S&P 500 closing yesterday at record highs, all-time highs. Coming into today, equity futures adding some weight to that, up by 0.6%, 0.06% higher on the S&P. Yields are up a single basis point, 4.1625 on the US 10-year. The euro slightly stronger, 109.35. Under Savannah's this morning, it's Biden-Trump once again. If you're a disillusioned Democrat, of which there are many today, I extend an open hand, an open invitation, and I ask you to join us on the noble quest of saving our country. When I gave my State of the Union address, I talked about how far we've come since the 2020 election. I also talked about how much is at stake. Folks, it's not hyperbole to guess. Our freedoms are literally on the ballot this November. How much Red Bull gets consumed between now and November? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Here's the latest. Former President Donald Trump clinching the Republican presidential nomination, crossing the threshold for the number of delegates needed to become the nominee in yesterday's primaries. Trump is now set for a rematch with President Biden in November. Bloomberg's Michael Shepard joins us now for more. Shep, I want to know the running mate. Who's the running mate going to be for the former President Donald we- Trump? And how long are we going to have to wait? Oh, Jonathan, I think we all want to know who the running mate is going to be. And we've seen a few names kicked around out there. We can be sure that it won't be Nikki Haley at this point, just given the distance between uh, Trump and his former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Uh, They had a bitter campaign, but there are a lot of other interesting names out there. If you're Donald Trump, you will want to make uh, every bit of this moment in the search for a running mate. And I can I would I would expect him to try to build the momentum and build the suspense and get as many of these prospective contenders down to meet with him, maybe even in public settings at Mar-a-Lago in coming weeks. Speaking of Ambassador Haley, she got more than 77,000 votes in Georgia yesterday, Shep, and she wasn't even in the race. She's bowed out. She's not going to run for president anymore. How difficult, given the fact that Trump lost Georgia by under 12,000 votes, how difficult is this going to be for him to make sure he can bring those Haley votes over to try to win back a state like Georgia? Well, that signals the big challenge that Trump faces and the underlying weakness that Haley was trying to point out during the campaign in a Trump candidacy. What she was arguing before she left the race is that there are a lot of Republican voters who don't want Trump on the ballot. And these are the people who were backing her. And some of them have indicated, even in conversations with me during uh, our trips to Iowa and New Hampshire, that they would rather vote for President Joe Biden if it came down to it than for Donald Trump. Biden himself has made an appeal to those Haley voters. We heard Trump trying to make an appeal to Democrats who are dissatisfied. But likewise, Biden is trying to reach that group of Republicans that has had enough with Trump and would rather see a changing of the guard. I had put their bets on and their uh, hopes in Nikki Haley 
only to be disappointed. Speaking of changing of the guard, the Speaker of the House is a Republican. And we've seen almost peak dysfunction, I would say, yesterday with Congressman Ken Buck saying, he, we already know he's retiring, but he's basically saying, this is so dysfunctional, I'm leaving at the end of next week. How will Republicans do down ballot for the House of Representatives and the Senate in November? Well, this poses another challenge for the party with Trump at the top of the ticket. You'll remember that during the midterm elections, Trump was widely blamed for contributing to the party's underperformance, even though he wasn't on the ballot. It was just the fact that so many Trump loyalists were and they didn't perform nearly as well as he had said they would and as the party had hoped they would. And Ken Buck had uh, notably broken with Trump. He voted to certify the election uh, in defiance of the president's wishes back in early 2021. And he had further uh, disagreements with the former president uh, over the past uh, year and a half. So this signals two things. One, that, you know, you're right that the House is a very dysfunctional place. Ken Buck didn't even give Mike Johnson, the speaker, a heads up that he was going to make this snap retirement announcement. But it also does signal another thing, that Trump's hold on the party is actually tightening. And that we could see a, uh, a more Trump faithful uh, candidate emerge to take uh, to take Ken Buck's place. Shep, how does that reconcile with what we're about to see on Capitol Hill today regarding TikTok? Well, it's a great question because, uh, you know, the House, as we know, is about to vote in a couple of hours on a measure that would seek to force the sale of uh, TikTok, uh, force ch its Chinese owners to sell the app or face a ban if they don't do so within six months. Now, this measure has gained steam very, very quickly in, in the chamber. It surfaced from out of nowhere after months of silence just last week. It passed this committee on a 50 to nothing margin, and we expected to get through the House by the two-thirds majority it would need to pass. Now, where does Trump come in? Earlier this week, he signaled his opposition to the measure, saying that if it passed, it would help Facebook. And his concern is that uh, Facebook would become too powerful and he would prefer to see TikTok uh, in some sort of a more competitive relationship and uh, really uh, coming up against Facebook. And remember, Facebook banned Trump shortly after the January 6th attack on the Capitol. That is one thing to note. There are also some other misgivings among Republicans, especially the more libertarian ones who would align with Trump anyway. And their concerns are more over free speech. Shep, we've got to leave it there. It's good to catch up. Looking forward to that vote a little bit later this morning. Michael Shepard there of Bloomberg. I'm reminded of a line that came from Mark Dow maybe eight years ago around the 2016 election, where he said the biggest challenge for investors was to divorce your politics from your market views. Over the weekend, JP Morgan's David Kelly wrote this in Barron's in an interview. He had this to say, I worry that people worry too much about politics. There are a lot of Republicans who missed out on good stock market returns under Presidents Obama and Biden, and a lot of Democrats who missed out on great stock market returns under Donald Trump. David Kelly in Barron's over the weekend. Read that interview. Catherine Keeling's back with us. Catherine, does that echo how you feel about politics? Do you have to divorce your politics from your market views? And how easy is that to do? Yeah, to a certain extent, you do, um, because... As, as David said, markets have done well regardless of which party is in, is in control. Um, and when you actually think about it, um, elections are about policy. Elections are about policy, but you don't know what the policies will be until you know who wins the, the presidency, the Senate, and the House. And most of the time, that's not a single party. One thing we do know about election years, though, and this is actually a very sort of consistent tactical trend, is that ever since World War II, when the incumbent president is running for re-election, that tends to be a very positive year in the markets. And so if we just step back and think about this year, we have an incumbent president running for re-election. Um, and what do we see? We actually see a lot of positives for the market. The Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, that money is coming into the economy right now and being spent. So uh, Congress is talking about a fiscal bill right now. So what you see in every election since World War II where the incumbent is running for president, whether they win or lose, it tends to be a very good year in the equity market. And in fact, it tends to be twice as good as the average year, up about 15 percent. And, you know, we're sort of on track for that right now. Does it matter more to you about who would be potentially the next Fed chair? 
Oh, the Fed chair is very important to the economy, obviously, right? It, controlling uh, interest rates, helping to control um, inflation and full employment. But so the Trump Fed has chair floated is very some interesting important. names in the past. That's why I bring it up. Yeah, the Fed chair is a very important uh, pillar of the economy. Absolutely. Catherine, we've got to leave it there. It's good to see you. Good Catherine to see Keating you. of Thank BNY Mellon Wealth Management. To Catherine's point, is the president likely to choose a Fed chair that somehow goes against his objectives for the U.S. economy? I think it's highly unlikely. The inflation dynamic, though, is the one to watch. You've asked this many times, and this is what I keep thinking about. How long does the U.S. have to have the privilege of acting recklessly? How long can there be these fiscal transfers? How long can there be dysfunction and, and sort of gridlock that just pushes over the, the finish line more money into the, into the pockets of people? I don't know the answer to that, but so far it seems like for a very long time. Is that your way of talking about the auction a little bit later? <laughs> of course. That was my side. Is yeah. it 30-year bonds later? $22 billion. There we go. You've got the numbers memorised, haven't you? I know you have. Coming up on this programme, <laughs> former New York Fed President Bill Dudley on the Fed's next move. That conversation up next from New York. This is Bloomberg. Let's run through the price action for you on the S&P 500 equity futures. Waking up this morning positive by 0.1% on the Nasdaq going absolutely nowhere. Amazing to see another all-time high on the S&P 500 in yesterday's session. Not what you would have guessed based on how CPI came in yesterday, hotter than expected. When we started sort of marking to market our commentary around the story as stocks started to rally yesterday, I think we both said at the time, Lisa, maybe taking some comfort with shelter, not running away in quite the same fashion as we did in January. But how many reports did you read before the CPI report came out that said this is the biggest risk event? If we get a hotter than expected CPI, expect risk assets to sell off. If we get a hotter than expected CPI, oh, who cares, right? I mean, again, it sort of raises this question. What's the real story here? And what's the narrative that markets Well, the underlying on? story keeps changing, and that's the confusion for the economists on Wall Street. So now all of a sudden, goods, core goods are starting to surprise to the upside. Services are starting to soften. And you've got to make your mind up. Do you have confidence in one more than you have confidence in the other? And do you really believe that goods disinflation has ended? That's finished. That process is complete. I'll give you an anecdote, right? Especially because people get, got comfort from the fact that home prices didn't accelerate in the same kind of fashion that some feared. This morning, their mortgage rates actually dropped a couple basis points, 18 basis points, to 6.8%. All of a sudden, mortgage applications surged upward, right? So here's the thing, right? This is a market that as the financial conditions ease, you start to feel that pressure. And it raises this question, going back to the cookies, the cooling cookies, is the oven still on? And if you put the pan on the oven, do they cool at all? And that, I think, is one of the key questions. And Ken Griffin kind of referenced this. I mean, he didn't reference this, but he addressed it, OK? We'll talk about the Ken Griffin comments later. He didn't talk about cookies. I want to turn elsewhere to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Yields up a little bit this morning by a couple of basis points. 460.93. A few Mondays ago, in the 470s, we came all the way back down to the 440s on Friday. So we've been all over the place in the last two weeks. Up two basis points at the front end. Up about a single basis point on a 10-year. 416.64. Let's finish on foreign exchange. I won't to talk too much about the euro. We've heard from a couple of officials on the governing council leaning towards the month of June for the first rate cut. The euro's a little firmer at 109.40. I want to sit on the Japanese yen, dollar yen 148, just to see that the auto manufacturers are having wage negotiations and that's part of the story, the equation for where you want to be in foreign exchange based on where the BOJ is going to be in the next few months. So we heard it from the likes of Mazda, Honda, and we're hearing it now from Toyota as well. And we're going to get that key moment. This is the moment Friday. you've been waiting for on Friday. Biggest stage point of the week. I mean, are you even going to go to sleep? Are you going to stay up, pull it all night, or just watch the wage negotiations and unions in uh, Japan? This really is the fact, this is where we are. Is this the deciding factor for a central bank that's taken the better part of two decades to make any move at all? Is this going to be the moment where I'm they doing live coverage rates? from my house, Daybreak Asia with the team. I will watch I'm taking that. Friday off. I will watch that. You're, um, da you're taking Friday off, right? I'm not. taking you're Friday off. No, I'm working you, overnight. No, you need, to, you need to pump it up. We're going to be getting the key important data point. I do the Japanese yen from home, OK? 147.99. <laughs> We're positive there by 0.2%. I've always dreamt of doing that, just sort of sitting at home. And then it actually happened. And I hated it <laughs> I know, it's for about months. To say. Yeah. Under surveillance this morning, the House voted today on a bill that would force TikTok's Chinese parent to sell it or face a US ban. TikTok CEO lobbying lawmakers on the Hill yesterday. Democratic Senator John Fetterman telling TikTok it's wasting its time, saying this. I love this. It's just so honest. I've spent hundreds of dollars on drunk elephant at Sephora 
because of my tween. That's annoying, but I think there's a security <laughs> issue as well. I'd hope so. And if they have nothing to hide, then TikTok <laughs> should be the first one to say, let's remove any kinds of possible connection there. And I support that. Hey, look, at least he's honest. Well, look, when I saw this quote, I literally thought of Lisa immediately because she's been talking about the fact that these tweens are on TikTok and then running into Sephora and buying all their skincare needs. I think a lot of parents at least resonate with this. But before he talked about Sephora, he said that TikTok actually called him and they were trying to get him to back off this. And he said, look, I was honest. I was clear with them. I think this is a national security risk and I'm going to move forward. With How it. much have they spent on lobbying? I've got it in front of me. ByteDance spent a record $8.7 million on lobbying, lobbying federal government last year. These are big numbers. These are huge numbers and not just TikTok lobbying. Then you have to think for Club for Growth. They now have Kellyanne Conway lobbying on behalf of them because there's individuals within uh, that organization that do not want to see this go through. But one thing that is kind of fascinating about this story is that, yes, they spent a tremendous amount of money lobbying. The story has been happening for years, but they seem to be caught on the back foot when it comes to this particular bill that has been almost going on negotiations in secrecy. And that is why you saw Sho Chu run to Congress yesterday to try to make sure he's having these meetings with lawmakers. It's not working. We'll turn to another story. The president of Poland warning Russia will attack other states if it wins the war in Ukraine. President Duda making the comments in an interview on Bloomberg's Balance of Power yesterday after a visit to the White House and a meeting with Speaker Mike Johnson. Poland is pushing the US to approve further aid to Ukraine. The Biden administration announcing a $300 million military aid package, the latest effort to secure aid with Congress at a deadlock. Look, we've talked about where the former president has been successful and where he struggled. He certainly struggled to blow up the TikTok effort. When it comes to foreign aid, he's been pretty successful. He has been successful. The only issue that he was not successful in was his comments about NATO. Poll after poll, research shows that Americans continue to support NATO or want to see that support even go higher when it comes to NATO countries. But when it comes to that foreign aid, Jonathan, that bill was bipartisan in the Senate got absolutely blown up when it comes to the House of Representatives. I promised you these comments from Citadel founder Ken Griffin. This is what he had to say. One in the Fed must move slowly in lowering interest rates to avoid having to reverse course down the line. Speaking at a conference in Florida saying this, quote, pausing and then changing direction back toward higher rates quickly would be the most devastating course of action to pursue. Ken Griffin, Lisa of Citadel. And this is really the fear that a lot of people have been raising. The idea that the Fed is missing some of the heat in the CPI that people are dismissing is simply one-offs. If that's the case, what is the risk of keeping rates higher for longer? This to me is one of the key questions you hear Fed officials asking as well. If there is no risk, why cut? It's the question to ask officials, what is the biggest risk? Cutting too soon, holding too long? I imagine that that data point over the last couple of months has just changed that risk just a little bit. I'm not sure if it's changed the base case, but it's changed the probabilities around the story. Which is the reason why I think it'll be very interesting to see this press conference yes, uh, next week and see whether they change any of their dots, yes, but whether you hear a slightly different tone from Fitcher Powell. That meeting a week away today, looking to guide the economy to a soft landing while pushing out the first rate cut. Former New York Fed President Bill Dudley warning the next goal is reducing QT, writing this in Bloomberg Opinion. A final plan should be in place by the middle of the year. Whatever happens, the destination matters a lot more than the speed. I'm pleased to say that Bill Dudley joins us now for more. Bill, let's talk about this. What kind of considerations go into making a decision like this one? You want to behave in a way that does not risk causing uh, turbulence in financial markets. So the reason to do the taper is you're not really sure what the desired level of reserves is in the banking system. So you want to approach the runway very, very shallowly rather than steeply, especially when you don't know where that runway exactly is. So I think the taper is a uh, you know, prudent course of action. It doesn't really matter if you get to the desired level of reserves in two years versus one year. It's just the fact that you get there. So I think that you're, they're going to discuss it at the March meeting. That was made, made clear by Paul's press conference, last press conference and in the FOMC minutes. And then they'll talk about the staff's proposal. And I think we'll see a final plan uh, by, by, by mid-year. Bill, you've said the central bank needs to shrink the balance sheet enough to rebuild the stimulus arsenal. I just want to get into that a little bit more. I've said this to you before. I feel like this is some kind of Jedi mind trick of the Federal Reserve. They want you to simultaneously believe that QE stimulates and QT does nothing. Bill, what does QT actually do? Well, QT does withdraw restraint that they've put into the system previously. 
But uh, economics, people, economists who have looked at QE versus QT find big effects when there's QE announcements, very little effects when there's QT announcements. And the reason is sort of obvious. Uh, when, you don't re- ever know when QE, a QE program is going to be implemented. Uh, the economy has to be really falling apart. Interest rates have to be at the zero lower bound. So QE is usually a surprise. Uh, QT, though, once you've done QE, you know QT is going to follow at some point. Uh, that the Fed's going to ultimately unwind the QE that they did earlier. So when QT happens, it's really a question of timing and magnitude duration, not whether it's going to happen or not. So it has pretty much more milder effects. There's also a Jedi mind trick going on, Bill, when it comes to financial, uh, just in general conditions. The fact that we've seen dramatic easing in financial conditions, and that doesn't seem to be weighing on the Fed in terms of how that affects their ability to get to 2%. But when you saw a sell-off, that was concerning and some sort of restriction. Does that concern you that the easing in financial conditions doesn't seem to be anywhere on the radar of Fed officials? Well, I think it's in the radar in the sense that the reason why financial conditions have eased is because people expect the Fed to cut rates this year. So, But the Fed actually has to cut those rates to keep financial conditions where they are today. Um, I think at this point, we, we know that March is off the table. May is probably off the table, too. Uh, we're really talking about what, you know, Fed cutting rates probably sometime this summer. The focus at the meeting, as I said, is going to be, Paul's going to get a lot of questions about the QT taper since the, the people know that's on the table. But the other thing that's going to get a lot of attention is the summary of economic projections and how many rate cuts do Fed officials pencil in uh, in their forecast. Last time, the median was three. I would guess the median will be three again this time. But there's some po- possibility, given the firmness and in the inflation data, that uh, maybe maybe those are only going to be the media is going to shrink to two. But I would I bet they keep where they were last time. This, still plenty of time, still plenty of meetings this year to cut rates three times. But this goes back to the question that we've been asking all morning: Has the balance of risks, arguably on a minor way, shifted just a bit after the CPI print to the fact that maybe? it makes sense for them to hold rates higher for a bit longer because it doesn't seem like it's dampening some of the economic activity or materially harming the U.S. economy. I think it has, but I think that's their, that's been their strategy all along. I think the market got way ahead of the Fed earlier this year when the market was pricing in six to seven rate cuts this year, and the Fed was saying, no, we're going to do quite a bit less than that for the very reason that, that you said, that the Fed wants to be sure that they're going to actually be successful in getting inflation all the way down to 2%. And the you know the not-so-good inflation prints that we saw recently you know, just reinforced that. So I think the, 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 the world is sort of going the way the Fed Reserve was expecting rather than the way markets were expecting. And I think that, you know, I think there's plenty of time to see how the balance between growth and inflation plays out. If, you know, as you as you know, these are balancing acts now. The Fed is focused on both sides of its dual mandate, not just inflation, but also what's happening to the economy. And while the economy has held up quite well, there are signs that it is slowing. And so uh, the Fed is trying to get the balance right between these two risks. Bill, this is the total opposite of the conversation we had post-GFC. I was talking about this a little bit earlier in the program. I want to do it again with you. I think it's important. Coming out of the great financial crisis, 07, 08, 09, we always had these charts that came out and it was basically Wall Street looking for liftoff at the Federal Reserve. And then you had Fed funds just doing nothing for years. And every single year it was liftoff, liftoff's coming. It was false dawn, false dawn, false dawn. Are we looking at a situation that could be the total reverse of that, where we have again and again just a false dawn looking for cuts that never come because this expansion just looks so much better than people thought it would be? Well, that really depends on how tight monetary policy is. And that's one thing we don't really know. Every time the economy turns out to be stronger than expected, people start to talk about, well, maybe monetary policy is not as restricted as we thought. This is coming back to the discussion of our star, the neutral uh, federal funds rate. Uh, one other thing that's going to be interesting in the upcoming meeting is whether Fed officials uh, raise their estimate of what a neutral monetary policy looks like. If you look at the current projections, they think that at 2% inflation, the federal funds rate to be neutral should be 2.5%. And it's very possible, given the strength of the economy that we've seen over the last year, that they're, they're going to start to push up those estimates. Well, that's exactly where I wanted to go. Katie Kaminsky earlier was saying there's a real signal from the fact that financial conditions have eased so much in the face of uh, rates that have remained so high. Do you take that signal? Do you think that the Fed should be lifting their R star rate, their neutral rate expectations? Yes, I do. I, I think that I think there's lots of reason to think that R star is, is higher than it was in the past, in the recent past. Uh, fiscal policy has been very expansive. 
The government has put in place a number of new investment programs, CHIPS Act, infrastructure spending, climate finance. So all those things are increasing investment relative to a diminished savings pool that we should raise our star over the longer run. I also think that financial conditions are the right way to think about monetary policy. And so to your point, if financial conditions are easier, then there's less easing for the Fed to do. Bill, just a final question from me. You've alluded to this, but just to speak a little bit more clearly on the topic, how uncomfortable should they be, will they be, with yesterday's CPI print? I don't think the Fed takes a lot of signal from one or two inflation prints after a series of very good inflation prints. But I think you know the fact that it's now two rather than one uh, is, is getting is, – it's now on their radar screen. Bill Dudley of Bloomberg Opinion. Bill, appreciate it. Thank you, sir. They were looking to gain confidence. Have they lost some? in the last couple of months. What we heard just there is, on the balance, yeah, you have to think that on the balance they have a little bit, and I would agree with that. Federal Reserve decision, about a week away. Let's get you up to date on some stories elsewhere. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Fires erupting at a major oil refinery in Russia after a drone strike from Ukrainian forces. The facility, about 120 miles away from Moscow, serves as a key supplier of fuel for the eastern part of the country. The strike marks the second instance this week of Ukrainian drones damaging Russian energy plants. President Vladimir Putin saying the attacks aim to interfere with Russia's presidential election this week. Back in the U.S., questions about President Biden's mental fitness took center stage on Capitol Hill during special counsel Robert Hur's testimony. He's the prosecutor who declined to charge the president over his handling of classified documents. And in his report, he described President Biden as being a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Her defended his decision, saying, quote, I understood that my explanation about the case had to include rigorous, detailed and thorough analysis. I could not simply announce that I recommended no criminal charges and leave it at that. I needed to explain why. Shares of Dollar Tree are lower in the pre-market after the company's first quarter earnings guidance missed estimates. Its fourth quarter sales and earnings also coming in lower than expected. Plus, the company said it plans to shut family dollar, 600 family dollar stores. The Dollar Tree CEO expecting to face headwinds in the first half of this year, but hoping favorable freight rates ease the pres- pressure later in 2024. And that's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Yahira, thank you. Up next on the program, rounding out a big week of bond auctions. We definitely think inflation is the second half of this year's story. And when that happens, then you see um, less people being willing to buy bonds and the supply come back into uh, the picture as well. Another big auction coming up a little bit later. That story up next. Stocks doing okay, better than okay. We've just been spoiled. It's been record high after record high. Got another one in yesterday's session. Equity futures right now, positive by 0.1%. Yields up a single basis point, 4.1664. Light on economic data this morning, heavy tomorrow. Retail sales, PPI, jobless claims, just around a corner. Under surveillance this morning, rounding out a big week of bond auctions. People will buy treasuries as long as the economy is resilient. I think inflation comes back on the radar the second half of the year. We definitely think inflation is the second half of this year's story. And when that happens, then you see um, less people being willing to buy bonds and the supply come back into uh, the picture as well. Here's the latest this morning. This week's Treasury auctions concluding with $22 billion of 30-year bonds. This after the 10-year auction drew some lackluster demand. Willie Caesar of Credit Size sticking with her call of 3.75% on the 10-year yield and expecting the yield curve to steepen into positive territory by year end. William, pleased to say, joins us now for more. Winnie, a few pieces of that puzzle. Piece one, you believe there is a May start to rate cuts and I believe 100 basis points of cuts this year. Why doesn't the data point to start the year, January, February CPI, change that story? So, John, good morning. Thanks for having me. I think that the CPI prints have definitely been something that we've been paying attention to, but they're not the only pieces of economic data that we're looking at. We did have a consistent with potential cuts uh, payrolls report last Friday. We've seen some other places that prices have come down in the ISM reads. And so when we put the broader picture together, we do feel comfortable that the economic data, while not wholesale cooperative 
is inching towards the likelihood of a cut in May and further cuts after that. Although, Winnie, I have to say, there seems to be these sort of two-sided stories. On one hand, you've got resilience and strength in corporations, which is the reason why spreads are coming in and risk assets mm -hmm. are rallying. And on the flip side, you're seeing uh, signs of weakness that people point to for the reason why inflation will keep going down. Which is it? So it's a really tricky one. And I think that we have to remember that as inflation moves down, that is positive for corporations from the price perspective, right? A lot of the challenges that we saw in corporate earnings in 2022 were very much related to input costs, to energy costs being higher, to shipping costs being higher. And at the same time, we've started to see that deceleration in the ability to pass things through to the end consumer. And so it's always that balance that corporations need to strike to really hit that sweet spot in terms of maintaining uh, margins and you know not needing to do widespread layoffs. Um, and I, I think that we are kind of approaching that, that better equilibrium in the corporate earnings cycle. I guess I'm struggling to understand how you can say on one hand, rates are restrictive, and on the other hand, you're seeing, in some cases, record paces of debt issuance, both in the government and on the corporate side, and you can see that demand for it is just insatiable. I mean, what message do you take from that, given the fact that it seems like companies are managing just fine through this cycle? It is a really interesting dynamic, especially the demand component, as we have seen a significant return to demand really across a broad base of investor types into fixed income, especially in the U.S. markets, also in the European markets. And I think what that signals is most people are not anticipating a re-hiking cycle or a re-acceleration in inflation that would drive more rates volatility and higher yields overall. Instead, people feel pretty confident to say, okay, rates are probably at near the peak and we, we are okay putting cash to work in fixed income, even if they hold steady around these levels. Although I have to wonder at what point going forward, you start to push back a little bit. We've seen triple C's in particular, some of the riskier segments really start to rally as people search deeper into uh, risk at a time where people are saying survive till 25 in 20, 2025, mm -hmm. you're going to have this real maturity wall. Have people gotten a little ahead of themselves? So I think that people are being very circumspect in trying to figure out what are the appropriate triple C's to be buying and what are the more leveraged balance sheets that are just not going to work in a higher for longer or sustainably elevated rates environment. Where we're a little bit more concerned about people getting ahead of themselves is perhaps on the leveraged loan market, where elevated policy rates for longer than expected are probably going to play an even more detrimental role in fundamentals there. Winnie, I just want to finish on Japan. We're about to see something we haven't seen since 2007. Lisa's been talking about this for a while. Why do you think global fixed income is so comfortable now with something we've been waiting for for a long, long time? I remember all the bear arguments about what would happen when they had to get away from QE in Japan and start hiking interest rates. That it was going to be the end of fixed income. Yields were going to surge worldwide. Why isn't this going to shake up corporate credit in America, treasury yields, etc.? Well, I think that we now have the benefit of two very aggressive policy cycles in the U.S. and in Europe, giving investors a little bit more confidence that the global economy can actually withstand elevated rates, especially when liquidity in the global financial system is really quite robust. And we continue to see kind of at the fringe fiscal policy support as well. And so now we just have a little bit more evidence that, you know, higher yields is not necessarily going to cause that cataclysmic rollover in the financial system. When he sees a credit site, Winnie, thank you. That is quite a change, Lisa. And it started in Europe for me, for the ECB. When the ECB started hiking interest rates, I never thought they'd end up where they've got to. I certainly didn't think they could do both that and NQE without there being some major problems on the periphery. And there haven't been. I know they had hiccups along the way and they had to come up with certain programs too. But we didn't see the big, big issues that many people expected. I hear you. I'm on the same page. I think a lot of people are. Everyone was talking about Armageddon and the debt market. If you saw rates ever rise and all of a sudden, here we are, things just moving along swimmingly. It raises this question about the fiscal transfers that we heard from Winnie Caesar. We heard that from Bill Dudley. We've heard that from every guest who's come on, that that's been the big surprise that's really fueled a lot of the strength that we've seen. 
how long can that go with governments basically transferring their balance sheet to private balance sheets? Yep. I don't really know the answer, but that's what I keep thinking about this morning through all these conversations. I'll go back to the conversation we had with Howard Marks of Oak Tree just in the last week. This is what we talked about with him. Where's the leverage? Where's the leverage? Corporate balance sheets are stronger. Household balance sheets are stronger. They are stronger because the leverage went to the sovereign balance sheet. And yet here we are. Here we are, even with all these rate hikes, even with the end of QE, rates haven't spiraled away in the way that I think the biggest bears would have thought they would have done. That's the reason why I watch auctions. And every time they just go through, yesterday was a little weaker. You know, today we've got the 30 year auction. People aren't pushing back in a material way because they're still counting on the fact that rates are going to reflect an inflation rate that is coming down. Not necessarily this premium that's baked into transferring the wealth of a country into the balance sheets of companies and corporations. Now, granted, the BOJ is still targeting 0% on a 10-year, I believe. Yeah. I mean, what is the 10-year right now? Yeah. I mean, I think it's actually above zero, though. So Yeah, yeah there's been a little bit, there's been some tolerance, some increased tolerance of to how yeah. that breaks to zero point one. Out. Yeah. Big changes over at the BOJ. <laughs> I mean, we might actually get a rate hike. I know. Which is something. To zero. Yeah. OK. Coming up, Mandy Zhu of SIBO. I mean, it's so well said. <laughs> FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr, Stephen Stanley of Santander and Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. More still to come. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Slightly positive. No drama. Up by 0.05%. In the bond market, yield tire by a few basis points. Up two at the front end of the curve on a two-year 461. On a 10-year, positive two basis points today to 417. This is Bloomberg, the third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next. I think inflation is a story of the past. You may have some hiccups here in the short term that could create some near term volatility. Our highest conviction view this year was volatility. I think inflation comes back on the radar the second half of the year. What I think is going to happen over the course of this year is, yes, inflation is going to come down slowly. That deep inflation tail risk has kind of been cut off. So if you were to get inflation to a level where we have to kind of respect that tail again, then, yeah, that becomes a real risk for the market. The broad index is telling you a message. Inflation sticky. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne Marie Hordern. <laughs> The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your equity market on the S&P 500 just about positive after closing at all-time highs in yesterday's session. Anticlimactic in so many ways. It's the calm after the storm, Lisa, that never came. That's been the story of the entire year. Basically, everyone's calling for a storm, people coming out, this can't last, it could be a bubble. Can't, can't take it. Guess what? We're now north of 5,200. The year-end price target that people upgraded to just a month ago. When do we get people upgrading to 56, 57, 5,800? Because this train keeps moving. It's kind of snoozy this morning, and I welcome it. We're looking ahead to retail sales tomorrow, PPI and jobless claims. We're light on data this morning, AMH, but tomorrow, looking at claims, 218 is the estimate so far in our survey. That is barely moving from the 217 in the previous week. And historically, if you plot a chart, that is very, very low. Yeah, it is very low. And it's something that obviously this is one part of the mandate that the Fed is very happy with. Under 4% for unemployment for two years. You remember the depths of the pandemic. Also, when Biden came out yesterday to talk about the inflation report, obviously he leaned into the good things out of the report because you can just extrapolate what you want to prove your thesis if things are getting better or if you're concerned things might be getting worse. But again, he pointed to the job market which I think is the White House's way of saying, we know inflation is still a little bit rough and sticky for some parts of the consumer, but look at the job market. Unemployment under 4% for two years. I love what David Rosenberg said. People are looking to, at the economy like it should trade like Bitcoin. It doesn't. It's a slow-moving train. I understand that, but it just is hard to get a signal, uh, given the fact that, you know, we're trying to read in, you know, Bitcoin-like moves. Isn't that a Wall Street bias? Of course. Everyone wants everything fast. Well, yeah. You want to turn the page on the chapter? Well, normally you have a Get sense... to the end of the book really quickly. Okay, you're talking... I know. You're calling me out. I did that as a child. I was 100% that person... You went person to the end. ...who read the last We, we all did that, Bramo. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, anyway. You ruined but the I, entire book. No, it's that I couldn't handle the suspense. Then I could enjoy the rest of the book. But here's a question. At this point, if we don't know what cycle we're in, 
that's the frustrating thing. How do you know what paradigm to really even invest in? And patient Bramo, I can't imagine that. Oh, all right. All. all right. No, Enough no with the sarcasm. Equity futures on the S&P 500 <laughs> look like this. Equities are totally unchanged to slightly positive, up by 0.04%. Yields are higher by three basis points. Bit of price action in the bond market for you. Into some supply at the long end of the curve later. 4.1781 on a 10-year Lisa On a 30-year, up two basis points to about 4.34. And we do get that auction later today. I am curious about it. Remember when Stuart Kaiser came on yesterday and said, can you imagine if we get a hotter than expected CPI and then a weaker than expected 10-year auction? Guess what? We got a hotter than expected CPI and we got a weaker than expected 10-year auction and no one cared, right? Do we get the same kind of thing today, given the fact that we've got $22 billion of 30-year bonds being auctioned off at 1 p.m.? Really a key question. It just had the biggest one-day move higher on the S&P 500 of the month so far. Coming up, CBO's Mandy Zhu on volatility across asset classes. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr joins us to discuss the House vote to ban TikTok. And Santander's Stephen Stanley looking ahead to next week's Fed decision. He's forecasting only 50 basis points of cuts this year. And those cuts don't begin until after the election. Looking forward to that a little bit later. We begin with our top story. Stocks hitting fresh all-time highs, even with February CPU coming in hot. An equity decline lasting only a few minutes, giving way to a rebound, pushing the S&P at more than 1%. That move only happening on a handful of CPI days since March 22, typically on the back of a lower inflation print and not a higher one. CBO's Mandy Zhu saying this, equity volatility has declined significantly over the past year. Low volatility isn't a unique feature of the equity market, but a phenomenon we're observing across every asset class. Implied volatilities have fallen broadly and significantly Significantly across equities, credit, FX and commodities, suggesting that what is driving the VIX lower is very much macro fundamental in nature rather than equity specific. I'm pleased to say that Mandy joins us now. Mandy, good morning to you. Morning. Last time we spoke, you said this market was positioned and biased towards further gains. Is that still the case? It's very much still the case. And I think that's, you know, surprised a lot of people because I think going into year end last year, you can justify it because of positioning and the need to chase the upside. To start the year, we flip the page. And guess what? Exact same dynamic playing out in the derivatives market. We're still seeing extremely low levels of skew in the derivatives market, meaning no demand for downside and everyone's chasing that upside. Now, a lot of questions around whether this is euphoria, whether the momentum has gone too far. One thing I would point to, to maybe say that this potentially could be justified is if you just look at the underlying S&P 500 index, forget about the options market. One of the things that we've noted is that S&P has actually been more volatile on the upside than the downside, which is very different from how it historically behaves, right? So historically, markets crash lower, grind higher, and that's why puts trade at premium to calls. Over the past two years, the vicious moves has all come to the upside. So more volatility on market up days than down days, hence the need to use options to manage that volatility becoming greater on the upside. Would you describe yesterday as a crash higher? Exactly. I think because it's been consistent year to date as well, the biggest moves have all come from the upside, not the downside. And the you'd have to go back over 20 years to find a similar period when we've seen this inversion in terms of how markets are behaving. Are you seeing a lot more money coming in, kind of lured in by FOMO? Why is it that there are these sort of vicious moves upward? Do you have a sense of the anatomy of that? I mean, I think people are still like, Coming into the year, I think, you know, we're talking about where's the next leg higher going to come from. And sure, on the macro side, people have kind of reduced expectations of Fed rate cuts. But, you know, look at earnings. Earnings came in very strong. I think that's going to be what is propelling stocks higher going forward is the fundamentals. Um, and then, you know, you look at the money on the sidelines, you know, you know are we, you know, can, can positioning increase from here? I think it can. And certainly people are using options as a way to lever it up their equity exposure. We've had a number of guests say that they expect volatility to pick up more materially as the year goes on. I know you laugh because everyone's been saying that for the past five years and it only happens occasionally. But I am wondering uh, whether that matters even if the volatility is to the upside. If that's right. the case, then <laughs> does an increase in volatility even matter? No, I think it does. So when volatility picks up, people you know, tend to de-risk their portfolio, right? Whether you're a systematic investor or a um, discretionary investor. So a pickup in realized levels of volatility in the market matters. But exactly to your point, where, when and where it's happening also matters. And the fact that right now it's been happening to the upside, I think, is what is really underpinning a lot of the dislocations that we're seeing in the derivatives market. Is this what you call how to play options when it comes to U.S. exceptionalism? 
so that's that's a great theme that people are focusing on, right? So everyone well aware that the U.S. rally is very much driven by you know a couple, a handful of names, right? And there's a huge concentration risk. So to start the year, what we have seen in terms of themes is people looking elsewhere globally, right? Can Europe outperform? Can Japan? Can emerging markets, ex China, do well this year? So one of the things that we're very excited about actually next week is we're launching options on three new MSCI um, indices: MSCI Acqui, World, and USA to kind of help investors play that global, you know, international versus U.S. theme um, and gain exposure to international markets using options. How much of this is coming from institutions in terms of the trading and how much is coming from day traders that are really into the zero days to expiration options? But this is what we're all talking about. I mean, we were talking about this, you know, a while ago. How much is this people playing in this and trying to get a hold of it through the Robinhood accounts? It's both. I mean, I think the the, the growth in retail um, usage of options in the derivatives market, um, you know, over the past couple of years is certainly notable. But it's not just retail. It's not just FOMO, right? Institutional investors, and you see it, for example, through the growth in like income option strategies over the past couple of years as well. Institutional investors and retail investors are alike turning to options a for leverage, for directional exposure, but also for income. That's been you know very much the story over the past couple of years. And there is a gambling element to this as well. Zero day to <laughs> Expiry. You've continuously and consistently said that's not something we should be concerned about. Can we just go over that ground again? Why yeah. shouldn't we be? Sure. So the data, when you look at the data and the breakdown and the flows in, in terms of the zero day options, it's actually very balanced. I think that's what's surprising to a lot of people. It's yes, absolutely. There's a segment that is you know, of investors who are using zero day options for speculative purposes. But like I mentioned before, there's also a very uh, meaningful segment that are using those options for yield. So they're selling these options. So when the buy and the sell are balanced, the net impact on the market is very de minimis. Let's finish where we started. You talked about the bias being positioned to the upside. Is that that's still more pronounced in small caps because that's what you said maybe a month or so ago. Is that the same? Exactly. Yep. So if you look across all global indices, Russell 2000 currently stands out as the index with the flattest levels of skew. Um, and that's really on, on the back of that upside call demand. So positioning for a broadening out of the equity rally away from the large caps towards, you know, whether you look at equal weight S&P or small caps, that's definitely been where the interest has been. Interesting. Mandy, it's good to see you. Great. Always is. Thank you. Mandy Zhu there of SIBO. Let's give an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. German automaker Volkswagen is expecting orders in Western Europe to pick up as it updates popular models like the Golf. The company is looking to rebuild momentum in EVs and push forward with an ambitious savings plan as competition grows abroad. The Volkswagen CFO telling Bloomberg a drop in China's market share can be eased by growth in North America. We are deliberately prepared to give up market share in the next, I would say, one to two years, 2024, mm -hmm. 2025, in order to find a sound compromise between margins um, and, and volume. But from 2026 onwards, we want to regain share also in the BV sector. China's BYD overtook Volkswagen as the best-selling automaker in China last year. U.S. mortgage demand is growing as rates drop back below 7%. Data from the Mortgage Bankers Association says applications for home purchases grew 4.7 percent, hitting a four-week high. Despite mortgage rates falling from October's peak, rates are still twice as high as they were in 2021. The data covers more than three-quarters of all residential mortgage applications in the United States. And a dark side to the weight loss frenzy, UK authorities seizing thousands of packages containing fake versions of Ozempic. As demand for the treatment has risen, authorities say so has activity by organized crime, plus loan entrepreneurs looking to cash in, many advertising on social media. Patients across the world have been hospitalized after using counterfeits, with some found to contain lethal doses of insulin. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Yahara, thank you. That is pretty scary, isn't it? I'm not sure we should describe them as lone entrepreneurs. But sort of like, that's pretty scary. It is pretty scary. And it really raises this question, how quickly is this getting developed before it's getting distributed in a way that people are looking for? Yeah, kind of shocking. Up next on this program, TikTok in the hot seat. Your platform is basically an espionage arm for the Chinese Communist Party. Why should you not be banned in the United States of America? Senator, I disagree with your characterization. That conversation, up next.
Live from New York City, equities just about unchanged on the S&P 500 after closing again at all-time highs in yesterday's session. Yields creeping higher once more, up three basis points on a 10-year to 418. Under surveillance this morning, TikTok in the hot seat. Your platform is basically an espionage arm for the Chinese Communist Party. Why should you not be banned in the United States of America? Senator, I disagree with your characterization. Many of what you have said, we have explained in a lot of detail. TikTok is, is used by 170 million Americans. I know, and every love. single one of those Americans are in danger from the fact that you track their keystrokes, that all of that information can be accessed by Chinese employees who are subject to the diktats of the Chinese Communist Party. That, that why, not, why should you not be banned in this, in this country? Uh, Senator, that is not accurate. A, a lot of what you describe we collect, we don't. And it is 100% accurate. It's the latest this morning. The House set to vote today on a bill that would force TikTok's parent company to divest the app or face a ban. Sources telling Bloomberg TikTok is planning to exhaust all legal challenges before any kind of sale is considered. The company declined to comment on its plans, but saying the legislation, quote, has a predetermined outcome, a total ban of TikTok in the United States. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr joins us now for more. Commissioner, been looking forward to this conversation. I've got your comments in front of me on TikTok. You've called it before a clear and present danger to national security. I'm sure TikTok would disagree with that characterization as well. Can you give us some concrete examples, sir, of why you think that's the case? Yeah, the track record with TikTok's malign conduct is very clear at this point. For years, they told US lawmakers, don't worry, US user data isn't even existing inside China. And then a blockbuster report came out in 2022 that showed no, in fact, quote, everything is seen inside of China based on leaked materials. That's keystroke patterns, biometrics, search and browsing history, location. Then second of all, what the CCP are doing with that data is very nefarious. They use access to that data, personnel in Beijing did, to surveil the locations of specific Americans, journalists, that were writing negative stories about TikTok. Third, TikTok said, OK, you caught us red handed. We're going to wall off U.S. user data. But lo and behold, the Wall Street Journal report came out and found that personnel in Beijing are still getting access to that data, sensitive U.S. user data, after agreeing to wall it off. And the, the record goes on from there, including TikTok's parent, ByteDance, having a CCP cell embedded in its leadership. So this is about the malign conduct that an entity that is beholden to the CCP has been engaged in. When you talk about walling off that data, you're talking about Project Texas. Has it, has it not worked at all? No, not at all. So one of the leaked materials had TikTok trust and safety officials themselves saying that it remains to be seen whether product and engineering, meaning Beijing, can still get access to U.S. user data after mitigations like Project Texas are put in place. Second of all, that walling off of data that we just talked about was part of Project Texas. And again, Beijing still got access to it. And even TikTok CEO has said Project Texas will keep data from going to Beijing, except when we allow it pursuant to what they claim are new control. So Project Texas is about as secure as a sieve at the end of the day. In a day of uh, interesting and odd political bedfellows, what we saw yesterday in Capitol Hill is a lot of individuals come out and talk about free speech on the progressive left and the right. Ron Paul saying he's going to block anything that's contrary to the Constitution. Do you agree? Is there a free speech issue at play here? You know, look, Rand Paul's been great on these uh, liberty issues. This particular bill does not trigger a First Amendment concern for one main reason. The Supreme Court has drawn a clear line between regulations based on content of speech on the one hand and regulation of conduct on the other. And this plainly is a conduct law, meaning we're acting because of the demonstrated malign national security threat of TikTok, not because of the content of anybody's speech. And the bill is narrowly tailored, which is key for First Amendment analysis, because it simply requires divestment, meaning the millions of Americans that love TikTok, I'm not one of them, but they can continue to use the application, but just in a more secure way. So because of the conduct at issue here, the Constitution does not compel us to require a national security threat to continue to persist. Well, there's one politician in D.C. who certainly likes TikTok, and that's President Biden. In the sense of his campaign, they feel like they're able to reach the youth by using TikTok. So if TikTok is divested, there's a sale, would that mean that the Biden campaign can continue using it? But do you think it will be safer? Yeah, that's right. You know, a lot of people raise that concern about the Biden administration being on TikTok. But Biden administration officials have been very clear 
uh, that there's a national security threat here. That's why passing this bill actually squares the circle, because then the campaign or anybody's campaign could continue or start to be on TikTok, but without that serious national security risk that's present today. Commissioner, given the fact that we've heard that from President uh, Biden, I'm curious about your comments from the former President Trump, who seems to be, I don't know, less clear about what he thinks of this bill, saying, you know, that there's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad with TikTok, talking about how it increases the prevalence of meta. What do you make of his comments? Yeah, I think, first of all, President Trump, you know, fundamentally reshaped Washington, D.C. to understand the serious threat posed by the CCP. He's also raised concerns, as I have, with the conduct of big tech companies that are based right here in Silicon Valley. And those are real concerns. He pushed for Section 230 reform, which I supported and had hoped we would have gotten across the finish line at the FCC by now, and we haven't. But TikTok presents obviously sort of a threat that's fundamentally different than U.S. big tech companies. For all of my concerns with their conduct, and I have many, once we deal with the national security threat from TikTok, once you break that tie back to the CCP, then we should move very quickly, as President Trump has outlined on Section 230 reform, and in my view, affirmative anti-discrimination obligation that would apply across the board. But until you break that link to the CCP, um, a lot of other reforms just aren't going to work out. But it does feel like he flip-flopped on this in the sense that he wanted to ban it under his administration. Um, it then got held up in court. And now he's saying he's really not so sure about it. Do you think we could see a different, if he was to become president of the United States, a different view on TikTok because of his concerns of how big Meta is? Well, again, I think the reason why this bill is such a smart approach is because it's not a ban bill. It's a divestment. And so you, you would have TikTok go to a different, doesn't even need to be a U.S. company. It could be any company that's not chi tied to China, Russia, North Korea, or Iran. So you can continue to have TikTok in the marketplace as a counterweight to Facebook, as a counterweight to others, but it can be there in a way that doesn't present the national security threat. So it keeps that competition high. Commissioner, we seem to be ill-equipped to deal with these issues. It's been four years, about four years since we've been talking about mm -hmm. this and hardly anything has happened just in terms of actually passing proper policy to do something about these national security concerns. I think back to China, it's easy, it's straightforward. She comes out and says no, and then that's it. It's banned, it's all banned. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, no access. Why are we so ill-equipped in the West to deal with these threats, and how do we go about changing that? Yeah, we certainly have a very different system, obviously, than they do in China, and some people raise concerns about will China engage in some sort of reciprocal action based on that. And I remind people, Facebook and other U.S. technology companies are already banned in China. So yes, we move more slowly. We move in a much more considered way. And obviously don't underestimate the fact that, you know, ByteDance has put every single amount of lobbyist dollar possible to slow roll this. And people look at the 118th Congress and they say, you know, they have a hard time getting things done as a general matter. But this is one where the 118th and Speaker Johnson can land a significant legislative win, not just on a tough issue, but as you know, on a technology issue where it's sometimes difficult for Congress to act. And that's why the Commerce Committee with Chair Rogers holding that blockbuster hearing last March, I think that really set things in motion. Do people wish it would have gone faster? Sure, undoubtedly. Um, but arriving here today where there's a vote in the House is a significant moment. Significant moment in the House. But what happens next in the Senate, Commissioner? Yeah, I feel pretty good about the odds in the Senate as well. If you look back, actually, people sort of have forgotten this, but Senator Schumer joined in a letter with Senator Cotton back in 2019 raising serious concerns about TikTok's national security threats. So this is an issue that is a longstanding issue for Senator Schumer over there and many, many Republicans as well. So a lot of the focus has been in the House, obviously up to now. It will now shift to the Senate. But I think the odds are very good there as well. And I'm looking forward, hopefully, to the bill passing today in the House and then things moving over there. Commissioner, I want to finish on conduct versus content. You talked about this being a conduct issue. Do you believe there is a content issue in any way, shape or form as well? No, not at all. I mean, look, Sometimes we focus on the way the algorithm with TikTok performs, and people have focused on that, how it just shows content that is drastically different than any other social media, content that happens to align with the CCP. Again, it's not that content that's the concern for me. It's that that content shows there's such a drastically different operation of the algorithm that it goes fundamentally to conduct into CCP control. So when we talk about that, again, it's just further evidence of CCP control. It's not about the government acting based on content. Again, I'll give you one last analogy. Someone can take a pen and they can write the most salacious anti-American propaganda they want. There's nothing, rightfully, the government can do. But if you take that pen 
and you use it to pick a lock and break into a building, well, that's illegal conduct. We can take the pen and it's no defense for you to say that you were using it to write uh, previously. Commissioner, appreciate your view this morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. We'll catch up soon. FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr on the upcoming vote that's going to take place down in Washington, D.C. At least for a little bit later this morning. I'm just sitting here thinking about that. This question of is the algorithm content or conduct? I think that that's ultimately a key question for a lot of these places, because what you're looking at is the algorithm deciding what you see, how often you see it, but isn't necessarily the content itself, or is it? I mean, this is sort of a key question. Well, when he, when he talks about the nefarious flows back to China and their ability to push what you see, that's when he said this is the conduct of that algorithm. Maybe that content wouldn't end up at the top priority list of, say, a TikTok user if it wasn't for that algorithm. And that's really where he takes issue with TikTok and it being, you know, led by ByteDance, which is based in China. Remember David Rosenberg talked about Wall Street wanting to get everything fast? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this. Yeah. It's going to take a while. Well, it already has. Yeah. I mean, taking four years, it's going to take another four years. Wow. And they're talking about exhausting legal challenges. I mean, I get it. It's a feature of what we have here in our system in the West and, and not a bug, but part of that story is it takes time. And it raises a question of what the US is up against. Stephen Stanley of Santander up next. Stocks pulling back just a touch on the S&P 500. We're negative by, let's call it 0.1% on the S&P, down by about a third on the Nasdaq. A little bit of a move in the last 20 minutes or so. This from City just months ago, the last mile problem for inflation. Sticky services inflation, further evidence that inflation is not on a path to sustainably return to target. What does that mean for this bond market? The two-year this morning, the 10-year, the 30-year shaping up as follows. Two-year yield higher by three basis points, Lisa. Back through 460. If you take a look at the sticky inflation, just uh, that component, uh, the Atlanta Fed puts out this metric. And three months trailing, you're actually seeing it surge back up to 5%. This is the wrong direction. So I put that out on X or Twitter or whatever, and then people sure. say, this is backwards looking, and really everything's going to be fine. So ultimately, this goes down to a belief structure, which is the reason why the market just simply doesn't believe the story that some of the data suggests that, at least in the headline I mean, level. by definition, it's realized data, so it's backwards looking. I mean, exactly. I take issue with that. That's ridiculous. But we're data dependent, so okay. depend on it. Here's my issue. We're moving to goalposts. You're going to hear less about three months. You're going to hear more about year over year. They're going to find a way. You know, Steve Rusciutto sat here of Mizuho. Yeah. And Steve was right in the following sense. Steve is basically saying that they want to cut. They want to cut. Now, maybe the data's not on their side right now, but can they move the goalposts? I think they can probably move the goalposts if they want to. They can start looking at different things. They already have, right? I mean, the idea of, well, one data point doesn't matter. Two data points, well, you know, OK, maybe a little bit more. In the past, it would have been something that was key. And before we got yesterday's report, it was the most important report to, since we ever got. Yep. And suddenly, it doesn't matter that much anymore. Just like that. Bang. All-time highs and no one cares. Move on. Going to move on to foreign exchange. I want to talk about two currency pairs. Mentioned this a few times on the euro side of things at the ECB. A couple of members of the governing council of the European Central Bank talking about June as the time to go. I think the Bank of France governor, and we'll talk about him in just a moment. The Bank of France governor was talking about when spring is in Europe, which is from May to June. So, you know, it could be April to June. June. I mean, it's, it's, such, it's such European type talk yeah, well, right, from the central bank. Let me talk about the calendar and the seasons. Let's talk about flowers yeah. blooming. Well, OK, he, he's, he's a wonderful man and he's actually going to be in New York. And if you're listening, please join us. But I, I think that <laughs> it would be very, very curious uh, to hear his rationale about why the ECB could wait till June in tandem with the Federal Reserve, even though the backdrop is incredibly different there. You know, I mean, it sort of raises this question, where are the goalposts and how in sync are they around the world as they face off with sort of this dual mandate of inflation and an economic growth that they don't want to stymie? Which would make it easier for Japan. Dollar yen right now, 150, 147.98, positive by 0.2%. So that's a slightly weaker Japanese yen. But we're talking about automakers, Toyota, Honda, Mazda, raising wages for Japanese workers and ultimately teeing up the first hike in a long, long time in Japan. Tune in on Friday. Jonathan Farrell will be special streaming coverage live special overnight. coverage overnight on labor negotiations Me in and Man. Japan. Yeah. yeah, And it's going to be really David great. But he's going to be from his kitchen in his refrigerator that's perfectly organized. You're making me sound like the senator from Alabama. <laughs> it's going to be in my kitchen. I want, I want one of those performances. Inflation. You'd like one it of those? It's so big. I can cook as well. You know, I'll make that happen too. Please do. You're going to send the camera? Uh-huh, 100%. All right, I'm taking he does Friday have off. a pretty serious fridge, though. You know, I know. Well, I, I, I'm, ready to go. I'm happy to bring a camera.
And it's a Venice this morning. We won't be doing that. <laughs> the rematch no one wanted. President Biden and former President Donald Trump clinching their respective parties' nominations, formally entering into what's likely to be the costliest and longest general election in recent years. This as Trump continues to take further control of the GOP, firing over 60 RNC staffers and installing three allies, including his daughter-in-law, to leadership roles. Last month's Bloomberg Morning Consult poll shows Trump leading Biden in head-to-head matchups across seven swing states. And knowing the former president, and Marie, we're sitting here waiting for the running mate. This is going to drag on. You'd imagine he's going to take a long, long time and just let this play out and then build and climax at the right time. And to Mike Shepard's point, he actually might do it in public, draw up some of this conspiracy or mysteriousness about who he's going to pick. A lot of people are going to be flocking to Mar-a-Lago, making sure they get FaceTime with the former president if they think they have a chance at it. But Jonathan, you started this out correctly. It's the election, the rematch, no one wants. So I'm sorry to you if you're waking up and you're seeing this news and you're like, it's official. In our last Bloomberg polling, 52% of swing state voters say Biden's too old. And then nearly 60% say Trump is dangerous. This is the options the American people have, which is why they're frustrated and why you see people like RFK, who, by the way, he has interesting VP picks. If you want yeah, to talk about VP Aaron picks. Aaron Rodgers, New York Jets considered. Yeah, I'm not sure the New York Jets is going to be happy with that. But that's why you actually see his numbers tick up in some of these polls, because people just feel like, I don't like this system. I'm not sure the New York Jets is too worried based on the polling. <laughs> just going to throw that out there. It might distract him for a while, but... Let's put that out there, Bramo. And Honestly. maybe leave that there, too. <laughs> Let's leave that there. Honestly, I just, you know, I think that everyone wants to make this a show, Trump in particular. Hollywood. So it's going to be a show. It's going to be Apprentice, Vice President style. Exactly. You don't start Apprentice. promo in the movie eight months before it comes out, right? right? You sort, you sort of, of like drip feed and, Have and the tease rose. it. It'll Do a couple like, of social know, media things, those 10-second <laughs> bursts, you know? <laughs> Those kind of things. Yeah, so All funny. right. Anyway, let's talk about this. The Boeing fallout continues. United Airlines now telling the plane maker to stop building 737 MAX 10s as it switches to rival Airbus. Certification for the MAX 10 has been pushed back indefinitely as Boeing undergoes criminal and regulatory investigations by the DOJ and FAA. This as Southwest says it will have to cut capacity this year thanks to reduced Boeing deliveries. The airline saying it doesn't expect to receive any of the long-awaited 737 MAX 7 planes this year. We caught up with analysts a little bit earlier this morning. Colleen Becker, we talked about fares, how much they're going up. What did she say, mid single digits on yeah. fares this summer? I took that to mean five to six to seven percent. Right. And how much is this because they're not getting the deliveries and because they don't have capacity? And how much is this simply because they want bigger margins and they can? And baggage fees going up. She said about five dollars. which that really bothers you. Well, yeah, because if your fee is going up to board the airline, you know they're coming after you in terms of even if you have like a small cross body bag on, they want you to stuff that in your carry on. So carry on is becoming more difficult and they're really starting to become more aggressive on what you can carry on the plane. And then, OK, so carry on's more difficult. And now they're going to charge you more for your checked bag. You're not strategic about that. Do you not try and hide it? Do you know what frustrates me? The suit. The suit drives me nuts. I'm so, so careful about keeping the suit sort of, you know, unwrinkled. And then they offer to hang it up once you get on the plane anyway. I think that And then that's... they're sort of like, you can't take that uncertain, you shove it in your bag. It makes no sense at all. I just might argue that if you were with a different airline, maybe it wouldn't be a problem. Because it's not every airline. I'm oh, just you say want that. me to go to your airline? No, I'm just saying. Okay. You know, so you can have all your right. airline-specific suit issue. OK. At Bastion. Is that right? I'm not saying Maybe, possibly. Anything. All right, let's talk about your friend, Bank of France Governor Villeroy, saying the ECB is likely to make its first cut this spring, targeting the June meeting as most likely. Villeroy telling France Info Radio that the bank is, quote, very pragmatic and we'll see, depending on the data, most ECB officials are in agreement, with many also indicating June's meeting as the right time to cut. Signs of economic weakness could further bolster the case for a rate cut, given the difference between, say, Europe and the United States at the moment on that front. Well... Also, he talking about spring and saying, well, June is part of spring. Christine Lagarde called June summer. So let's just say where she was in Davos, she was like, it's likely going to be in summer. It pretty much all signs are pointing to this spring, summer, whatever you like to call it, June cut. Only Europe could have a debate like this. <laughs> like, when does summer start and spring end? I love Europe. Let's stick with central banks. The Fed's case for holding off on cuts bolstered by another hot CPI print. Stephen Stanley of Santander Right on track, writing this back in January. While inflation is headed in the right direction, it may not call to the FOMC satisfaction until later in the year. Market expectations for the timing and magnitude of Fed cuts in 24 are too aggressive. I expect the FOMC to reduce rates by 50 basis points in 24, beginning in the fourth quarter after the election. Stephen joins us now for more. Stephen, good morning. Good morning. World's come your way. I'll say it for you. Do you think the Federal Reserve dot plot might move your way next week or is that too soon? 
I think it's a little too soon. I, I think you listen to carefully to Fed officials, and they don't seem to have really changed their view fundamentally since um, since December. I, I think they're probably relieved that the market has come back into closer alignment with where they are, and they'll take that as a victory and, and move on. The Fed's in a quiet period right now, so we can't get the reaction to yesterday until next week. Can you go through the components of CPI? And just tease out what's going to go into PCE and whether they can take any comfort whatsoever from what happened yesterday. A little bit. I, I think in Jan January to me was the worst case scenario because the, the numbers were very high in the aggregate, but it was the noisy stuff that was going down and the sticky stuff that was really high. But we knew going in that January tends to be a little bit of an aberration. You tend to get high numbers in January. So a lot of the Fed officials said, hey, you know, one, one number, we're going to kind of sit and see what, what happens next. So February was better from that sense, but still not good. Um, we did see a little bit of a, of a deceleration on the services side, but services prices are still running very hot. Core services in the CPI were up 0.5, um, which was down from you know, much higher in January, but that's still nowhere near where the Fed would like to see. Well, so then are you surprised by the lack of reaction in markets? And I'm talking about stocks, yes, but I'm also talking about your world. In bond markets, yes, yields went up, but not that much. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, partly a function of where we are. I mean, you know, a couple months ago, we had as much as 170 basis points of easing price in for the year. Um, we got almost all the way down to the dots. We were in the high 70s at one point uh, a week or two ago. And at the beginning of the week, we were, you know, between 90 and 100, so a little more dovish than the markets. Now we're back into the 80s. So, you know, I don't think that the adjustment needed to be as large as it needed to be a couple of months ago. Does it mean that also this market needs to get its head around the idea of truly higher rates for longer? You know, we were talking about this with Bill Dudley, the idea that neutral rates might be significantly higher than they were in the past. And that will reset a lot of expectations. How much do you agree with that and kind of lean in with the idea that maybe we're not all that restrictive? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think policy is restrictive, but I would say it feels like the neutral rate is considerably higher than it was before the pandemic. Um, you know, my guess is it's in the, probably in the low three, somewhere between three and three and a half. The Fed is still saying two and a half officially, but when they're pressed on it, pretty much every official is saying, yeah, it's probably higher. We just, you know, they, I just don't think they've engaged on that yet. It doesn't, it doesn't make a big difference for them right now because the policy rate's above five, so who cares if neutral is two and a half or three? <laughs> um, but eventually they're going to have to come to that and, and, and make a much more uh, settled decision. It kind of makes a difference if it's proven that part of the disinflationary trends that we've seen over the last six months had nothing to do with them. And that ultimately that monetary policy has been irrelevant regarding what we've seen play out over the last six months in the data. Well, you'll never hear anyone at the Fed say that. But would you say that? Um, no, I don't. I, I do think that, that the economy is on a cooling path, but it's a very gradual path. There have been a lot of tailwinds for the economy, fiscal policy um, and a number of other things that have helped to continue uh, with let's take, strength. Let's take goods disinflation mm -hmm. of six months ago. How much of that was about the Federal Reserve? Wasn't that just a supply side story? I think that's predominantly supply side. Yeah. And now goods inflation is starting to pick up again. Core goods. Should they be worried about that? Um, I think that was probably, uh, I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. I think goods inflation, core goods inflation is probably going to settle out around flat, which is where it was running before the pandemic. Um, but again, I mean, the services piece is the piece that they've focused on. It's the, it's the piece that really matters for the underlying inflation rate. And they, maybe they've gotten a little bit of, of uh, progress there, but certainly not nearly enough. A lot of guests have come on surveillance and talked about it's all about housing and that people are looking to that uh, sphere, especially because arguably the Fed does have greater influence over that market. We're seeing mortgage rates come down just a touch and people flood back into the market. Does that tell you what financial conditions easing does in terms of just basically giving ammunition to an already pretty hot economy? Yeah, there's no doubt that, that housing demand is very sensitive to mortgage rates. I mean, we've seen every time mortgage rates have dipped, housing demand has picked up at least at the margin, and every time that mortgage rates rise, it, it falls off. The problem is on the other side of the equation, on the supply side of the equation, because you've got all these homeowners sitting on their 3 and 4% mortgages, and when the mortgage rate goes from 7 to 6.5, it's not going to encourage those folks to move. They're kind of locked in with those low borrowing costs. And so... You can move the needle on the demand side, but if you can't move the needle on the supply side, the market remains tight, which is why home prices have been rising 
and why, at least part of the reason why I think we've seen on the shelter cost piece that it's, it's proven more stubborn than, than people anticipated. You talked about the tailwinds for fiscal, and a lot of guests have come on and talked about that. But some trackers at Brookings, for instance, say fiscal policy has only basically helped growth 0.2 percentage points. Do you see it as a, as a bigger component? Um, I, I don't know if it's a huge component now. I, I mean, I think it, it was unprecedentedly important during and just after the pandemic, right? Because the government distributed just immense amounts of cash, trillions of dollars of cash to businesses and households. Um, I think the, from a household perspective, the, we're kind of back to normal uh, on that front. I think households have, have either spent down or seen the purchasing power of that money uh, eroded by inflation. Um, but households and businesses are still in very good shape from a balance sheet perspective, which means that they're not as, they don't have as large a need to borrow. And so the sensitivity of the economy to higher rates is not as intense as it might otherwise be. Let's finish on looking ahead to next week. Chairman Powell News Conference, statement, summary of economic projections as well. I know based on your note that you think that he's made some communication errors over the last few months. When he says a little bit more evidence, do you know what that means and what the kind of errors that you're talking about? What are they? Yeah, so I think he was too dovish in December. And I have to say, I think he was probably too dovish again last week when he said they were not far, right? Because that was out of step with what almost everybody else in the committee had been saying over the prior month. Um, it, it's interesting because in January, when he said we need greater confidence, he made it seem like it was just, oh, we probably need one or two more good inflation readings. Yeah. Of course, we've gotten two bad ones since then. But then other Fed officials came out. You got the same message from the minutes that it wasn't as simple as just that. It was more about the composition. It, which is something that I've been talking about. You've gotten improvement, as we've discussed, on the good side, and it's really been a handful of categories, but the services numbers are not showing progress, and that's what a lot of Fed officials have said. They need to see a, uh, a disbursement of the moderation. Can I finish on this, then? Is he a bad communicator or just really dovish? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I think, I, I will say, I think in the context of last week, you have to, you have to remember the audience. You know, he's talking in front of Congress, he doesn't want to antagonize, so he's kind of throwing that carrot out there of, hey, we might lower rates soon. Stop writing me letters. But, you know, <laughs> no. we'll see what he has to say. Next week, the audience is the financial markets, and, right. and so we'll see what he has to say. Stephen enjoyed this. Stephen Stanley of Santander, his call sort of standing the test of time so far in 2024, looking for 50 basis points of cuts, and those cuts won't come until after the election. Equities right now on the S&P turning slightly negative going into the opening bell. Let's get you some stories elsewhere this morning. Here is your Bloomberg Brief with Yahara Hackers. Hey, Yahara. Hi, John. Shares of Dollar Tree are lower in the pre-market after the company's first quarter earnings guidance missed estimates. Fourth quarter sales and earnings also came in short. Plus, the company expects to shut about 600 family dollar stores in the first half of fiscal 2024. The Dollar Tree CEO said he hopes favorable freight rates ease pressure on the company later this year. Shell is cutting at least 20% of jobs in its deals team as the company restructures to reduce costs. The cuts are expected to be announced in April, according to Bloomberg reporting. The division has several hundred employees handling mergers and acquisitions for Shell. The oil giant has already made similar moves across other units of its business, including low-carbon solutions, chemicals and IT. Citadel founder Ken Griffin says the Fed should move more slowly in lowering rates so they don't have to reverse course later. Speaking at the Futures Industry Association conference, Griffin said, quote, pausing and then changing direction back toward higher rates quickly would be the most devastating course of action to pursue. He thinks the Fed will be slower than people are expecting for that very reason. The Fed's next policy decision is due out next Wednesday. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John? Hey, Yahara, thank you. Thank you very much. Up next on the program, last call for TikTok. The track record with TikTok's malign conduct is very clear at this point. This is about the malign conduct that an entity that is beholden to the CCP has been engaged in. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg.
Equity's just about unchanged on the S&P 500. Open in bell. Let's call it 40 minutes away. Equity's going absolutely nowhere in the bond market. Yields higher by three basis points. 4.1820 on a 10-year in foreign exchange. Dollar slightly weaker. Euro stronger. 109.39. That currency pair positive by 0.1%. And crude getting closer to $80 a barrel on WTI. 79.18 up by 2%. Under surveillance this morning. Last call for TikTok. The track record with TikTok's malign conduct is very clear at this point. Everything is seen inside of China based on leaked materials. Personnel in Beijing are still getting access to that data, sensitive U.S. user data, after agreeing to wall it off. This is about the malign conduct that an entity that is beholden to the CCP has been engaged in. Here's the latest. The House preparing to vote in just over an hour on a bill that would force TikTok's Chinese parent company to sell the app or face a ban in the United States. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow of Bloomberg Technology joins us now for more. Ed, from your side of the table, from your perspective, are you thinking about suitors yet for this particular app, or is that too soon? I, I, everyone's making the kind of assumption that it's a foregone conclusion. You know, I'll leave, I'll leave the politics to AMH, but if, if this goes through in the House, there is a concern in the Senate, right, that this, on the other side of the table, allows whichever sitting president we have some overreach, some over-censorship uh, beyond the aims of de-risking uh, TikTok's relationship with China. But you guys showed the statement from TikTok earlier in your program, right? For them, it seems to be a foregone conclusion as well. The, 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 the ban in the US will be effective, and the, the only way that they can move forward is to find a buyer. I'd really end my thought, John, on that. Look at the actions of the Biden administration in the antitrust context and ask which of the mega tech, uh, uh, cap tech companies in this country would be realistically allowed to buy TikTok and then, you know, whittle the list down from there. I have to think, though, Ed, I mean, a year ago, I was talking about what CFIUS told TikTok, which is sell your shares or potentially yeah. face a ban. Even if the Senate slows it down, the direction of travels at TikTok, for the most part, is not welcomed in the United States in a bipartisan fashion. Well, so I, I really... In well, I, on that sense, though, we, in your interview with FCC Commissioner Carr, he made it really simple, black and white. All you need to do is sever the tie or cut the link, I think he said, to China. He even said that it doesn't matter if the buyer is a non-US entity as long as it's not China. You know, that makes it seem very straightforward, but I, I don't know that that's the case. I am wondering, Ed, about the confusion around what exactly the U.S. wants to do is coming to the fore, too. Because when we were speaking with the FCC commissioner, he was talking about algorithms as though that was separate from content. Do we have a sense of what the problem is in terms of how they are going to remedy it, whether it's not a sale, whether it's not a ban? Well, you also discussed with him Project Texas, right? The, the housing of U.S. user data in Oracle-owned and operated data centers in this country which means that on paper, Project Texas would uh, block any visibility of the, the Chinese government or any Chinese bite dance, the parent company of TikTok staff, from seeing the data. But in the opinion of, of FCC Commissioner Carr, that has not been effective. You know, he, he cites reports about, and, uh, about leaked documents showing that, that there was still some accessibility on the China side. The, the, the thing about this is like, there are 170 million Americans that use TikTok. President Biden has been using TikTok as part of his campaign. And so, you know, our reporting suggests that uh, a sale is what is going to be pushed for in the first instance. TikTok sees it as a last resort. But we, we're talking about this or framing it as an outright ban of the platform in the country. Yeah. And that is the, the feasibility question I'd raise. And just before you go, I want to talk about a former president, Donald Trump. Most people we've spoken yeah. to this morning think he won't be successful in his attempt to blow this up. But you can see, based on his communication, that he seems to consider Meta a much, much bigger issue. And I'm trying to work out, Ed, what that might mean for Mark Zuckerberg and the company if he gets a second term. Yeah, I mean, he's sort of flip-flopped. Uh, you will have seen some of the, the, the upside in Meta shares of late as that narrative's built out. Also, look at shares like Rumble, the, the conservative social media platform. I think they jumped 18% yesterday on a report. They were considering uh, buying the, the uh, TikTok US operations. Uh, but it's highly analogous, right? Uh, the, the Meta Instagram platform and TikTok, to all intents and purposes, they're short-form vertical video. And this change of position from Trump is very interesting. You know, the, uh, I guess that he's positioning 
uh, that TikTok remaining in this country is the lesser of two evils to his mind. And he's highly influential, uh, although he's not on those platforms, right? He's on Truth Social. So that's why when I'm preparing for my show later today, those are the stocks that I'll watch yep. in the immediate term. Hey, Ed, great to catch up. Looking forward to the program a little bit later. 11 a.m. Eastern time, a few hours away. Ed Ludlow, Caroline Hyde on Bloomberg Technology. A few things to look out for then. We get that vote a little bit later this morning, about an hour or so away. Then tomorrow we can sit here and talk about some economic data, Bramo. Jobless claims, PPI, retail sales. Arguably I'm more interested in retail sales. I, I know that this is sort of counterintuitive because a lot of people are looking at the others, but how much do consumers keep spending and how much do they push back against some of the higher prices is one of the key questions. And all we've seen is, even though there's been some revisions, is that the U.S. consumer is is healthy. Even though people say they're a little bit concerned about where prices are going, they keep going out and spending. Full coverage of those releases coming up tomorrow morning. Coming up tomorrow, we'll catch up with Russ Kostrick of BlackRock, Mark Lipschutz of Blue Owl, Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, and Rolf Habert of Janssen of Hamburg Lloyd. This was Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back to another special BNP Paribas Open update for Bloomberg TV and radio from Tennis Channel. Yuri Lehechka is enjoying life in the desert. The 22-year-old reached his first ATP Masters 1000 quarterfinal with a powerful victory over Stefano Tsitsipas. After taking the opening set 6-2, the Czech star kept his nerve and served out the straight sets win, which takes him back into the world's top 30 in the Pepperstone ATP rankings. And don't forget, Tennis Channel's daily live coverage hits the air at 1 p.m. Eastern.